Welcome back, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to the Orthodox Ethos Extended Podcast. And tonight, our topic is after 1,000 years in Orthodox examination of Catholicism. I hope you're well in this feast, uh, this week of the Feast of Pentecost, a free, fast free week, and we're going to be uh, celebrating all week as, as usual and, and then begin the fast next week for the great Feast of the Holy Apostles. But tonight we're going to be talking about a topic of extreme importance for all of us because we have in our life, I'm sure, many who, uh, who are involved or adherents or attendees uh, in a uh, parish that belongs to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and this this should be a topic that many of us should have interest in for the sake of those uh, who are not in the Orthodox Church, but all of you who are watching tonight who are interested in the Orthodox understanding and take on Catholicism. I think and I hope tonight this will be an education and it will be something that will be beneficial and edifying. So let's jump right into it, as usual, with our slideshow and our, our slides, our educational slides, which we uh, provide for all of our viewers. This is going to be uh, like all the rest. We're going to be always starting with the Holy Fathers. As we say every week, every time we have a show, it is impossible to come to know the truth or to grasp theology in any other way but by following the saints, by following the Holy Fathers. As we know, every great and holy council, ecumenical council, begins with those words, following the Holy Fathers, ipomenis tisagis patrasi. And like our father before us, this is our aim, and to present to you the truth uh, as witnessed to by the saints. And so let me just make clear from the outset that this presentation obviously is introductory uh, in scope. It cannot cover in depth all the dogmatic issues, and it's not meant to be comprehensive. It seeks to stress that which is often neglected or unknown, and we're not going to be able to get to everything. There are many issues that one could discuss, historical, theological, ecclesiastical, but we think some of the things we're going to talk about tonight are less stressed, less known, and particularly I would guess some of them are less known to those uh, adherents of Catholicism. So hopefully that'll be very helpful to everyone. Uh, to touch also on the most essential points of diversion and reveal the underlying causes as much as we can in a short time. We're trying to cover a lot of ground, so we're not going to be able to go very deep. But we're going to point to some of the other things that aren't discussed. And my, many times we see in contemporary Humanism that uh, things are boiled down supposedly to basically one or two issues, really one at the end of the day, the, the place and the power of the Pope of Rome and how the Orthodox are going to understand that and how much uh, room there is for some kind of compromise. Uh, that is not the... Uh, historical truth or the theological truth according to the saints of the Orthodox Church. There's much, much more uh, at stake and much more that divides, unfortunately, uh, adherence of Catholicism from the Orthodox Church. Uh, so we're going to try to get some of those that are less known and uh, but very important as well. And again, this is for the edification, hopefully, of everyone involved, including those who are not Orthodox. And so it's not directed against any individual adherent or believer. Uh, it's not uh, speculating about your motivations, your desires, your experiences, but it's talking about the Orthodox understanding and the historical truth and theological truth as we uh, see it from our vantage point. And uh, so let's begin where we should begin. And many people begin at 1054, and they have a fairly superficial approach to this discussion. Before I prepared for this um, podcast tonight. I'm watching a variety of um, 
YouTube videos where there are uh, people who've become uh, Roman Catholic, they've, uh, they've converted and they say, well, why didn't you become Orthodox? Uh, especially, I think this uh, 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 Pines from Aquinas had a number of those, uh, those kinds of discussions. And what was characteristic of the, uh, of the discussions was that the question of the schism was quite misunderstood and superficially treated. And that's fine in a podcast, but there seemed to be a lot of ignorance of the prehistory and what led up to it and what really happened uh, and why it happened. So we're going to do our best to treat that. We've done it already in our, ecclesi- uh, our, our class on ecclesiology. So some of this is going to be repetitive if you've seen that class, but it's good to be repetitive. And, and, and uh, we're going to add a little bit to it that we didn't do in that class. If you're interested in this, go into more in depth. We recommend you go to that. Um, and that is um, uh, this class here, Orthodox Ecclesiology, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, and the Great Schism especially. But this whole series over at YouTube.com, Orthodox Ethos, this whole series, a 10-week series on the uh, history, uh, the uh, dogma of the church, the ecclesiology of the church. And in this particular lesson, lesson five, we're dealing with what we're going to be doing, talking about tonight. So let's begin and look at this. Now, this is a very, very important ecumenical council. Many of you probably don't even know that there's an eighth ecumenical council, and there's actually a ninth ecumenical council. There's not just seven, even though many Orthodox in the English-speaking world uh, repeat that without understanding what they're saying. There are nine ecumenical councils in the Orthodox Church. They've been accepted and embraced throughout the Orthodox Church as as, uh, recent uh, as 2016, uh, in Crete, they were uh, declared uh, councils uh, of the Orthodox Church, and all of the decisions are normative. So, this is um, a very, very important council. If you don't understand what happened here and the prehistory, which we go into in the in the course on ecclesiology, you can't understand the schism, and you can't understand what happened in 1054, or uh, for that matter, from 1054 onward. Uh, so this. Council is essential. Now, it was held in 879 under the presidency of Patriarch Photios the Great. Uh, it was in the Temple of the Holy Wisdom, which you see on the left there, uh, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and it was attended by 383 fathers. Now, again, there are several things going on throughout the 870s, 860s, and 70s, which are really important to know. We can't get into tonight, but there's uh, the Council under the uh, of holy wisdom that uh, uh, preceded this. There's the robber council under Ignatius that was repudiated later. There's a lot going on. There's the co- council that condemned Pope no- Nicholas. Uh, and uh, so, if you want to go deeper, go to the ecclesiology course. Go to that particular lesson and uh, and listen to the whole thing. And you'll you'll get much more. But we're going to focus quickly on this council. It was confirmed. It confirmed the seventh ecumenical council. And it anathematized those who rejected it. So what is it? why is that important? Well, there were uh, those who did reject the Seventh Ecumenical Council among those in France and among the Franks. Now, the Franks are going to play a huge role. They're the na- one of the main reasons why there was a schism to begin with, uh, their political uh, uh, ambitions and, and machinations had a lot to do with why the Pope of Rome uh, eventually um, took the path he took and turned back this council. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about in that as we go forward here. So it's a very important that this council accepted and embraced the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And that was not an accident. It was directed in part, all great councils except the ones before them, but it was also uh, directed in part against those heretics who still had not re- accepted the council. Of the Seventh Ecumenical, which there were iconoclasts still around at this time. And so it also recognized the most holy patriarch Photios as the only legitimate and canonical patriarch and outlawed the, and repudiated the councils which had been held against Photios in Rome and Constantinople. Now, I need to stress that at this council, there were papal legates. They were representatives of the Pope who embraced all of the decisions of the council, and you shall see, so did the Pope in many letters. So this is very important and significant that these, uh, that the Pope and, the, and his legates rejected the previous councils of, the, of 
his predecessors in Rome that had condemned St. Photios. And his council decreed that the symbol of faith should remain uninnovated, without innovation, without change, immutable forever. And it uttered horrible anathemas against any person that should dare to add anything to the creed or to remove anything from the creed. And of course, most of you should know that there was an addition to the creed, which is the cause, uh, is the heart of the cause of the schism and the, the beginning of this terrible adventure of the departure uh, of the West from the communion of the four patriarchs in the East. And so those who did that, who added to the creed, they are under anathema by this eighth ecumenical council. They turned away from the council. And that's really, really, really important to understand. If you want, if you're looking for the truth, you're not yet decided, you're a Protestant looking into Orthodoxy, Catholicism, or you're a Catholic who's kind of wondering what's going on, why are we in chaos, uh, why is uh, the Pope outlawing the Latin Mass, and all kinds of other things that are going on in the world today uh, in Catholicism. Well, it's important to know your history, important to know where this all began, why it's not 50 years old, it's not 100 years old. It goes way back, and I would say it begins right here when the when the West turned its back on the council that it had embraced. Now let's learn a little bit more about that. Let's see. What's important to realize that this council was recognized as the eighth ecumenical council, not only of course in the East but in the West for two hundred years, for more than two hundred years. Uh, and it wasn't changed until long after the schism, after the after the, the break in communion and the walking away of the Pope from the communion with the rest of the Eastern patriarchs. After that, as in uh, decades and decades after that, they said, oh, wait a minute, we don't actually believe that anymore. We reject that council. And it's really important to understand that. But let's see what this council did this council officially prohibited any addition to the creed, as we said, rejecting then the filioque, which was in use in many churches in Western Europe at the time, though not in Rome until 1014 or 1009, actually, and 1014 as well. There were two major events we'll talk about. It implicitly rejected the principle of papal supremacy or jurisdictional authority over other local churches in that this council rendered null and void the pro-papal Ignatian council in Constantinople 10 years later, 10 years earlier. So let me just repeat, why are we starting here? Because you have to start here, right? We said this, we, we entitled this talk tonight, After a Thousand Years. So you might be thinking, well, we're gonna talk about contemporary Catholicism. Well, we're gonna talk about a lot of things from then to today. We're going to end up in a day. But it's not. The most important thing is to understand how we got here, right? So you got to begin at the beginning. And this is very important that this council of 383 fathers, including the papal legates, render, rendered null and void that council which the pope had inserted his authority over Constantinople. They rejected that. And therefore, they rejected the idea that the pope was a supremacy over the patriarch of Constantinople and over uh, the churches in the east. And one of the greatest ironies of Christian history, the Phocian Council, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, was recognized as legitimate by the papacy for nearly 200 years until the period of the Gregorian Reform, when the canon lawyers of Pope Gregory VII rejected this council as the Eighth Ecumenical Council and named the one that had condemned Photios 10 years earlier and had the support of the previous popes as, uh, as eighth, uh, the Eighth Ecumenical. But it's very interesting that they, well, they showed their hand that they knew that that was the Eighth Ecumenical Council. We'll see that in a second. So how did it happen that Rome, now dominated by the Franks, came to abolish an Ecumenical Council? So now we're, we're up in the time of the 11th century when they overturned their acceptance of Eighth Ecumenical Council. How did that happen and why? We'll get back to the schism in a minute, but let's let's see, why did they overturn this count? So important, right? Well, scholars, including Roman Catholic scholars, point out that Roman Catholic canonists first referred to their Eighth Ecumenical Council, the Ignatian one, in the beginning of the 12th century. So in the beginning of the 12th century, 1100s, 
Uh, canonists start to say, but it, it's, a, it's a process that's going on in Rome, this, this re-evaluation, uh, that, yeah, well, actually, no, 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 we, we embrace the other council. And they did it because they deliberately wanted to get a hold of a canon that was passed in that council, Canon 22, which supported a very strong and robust papacy. So that was just real politics. We need that canon to, to, to support our power, uh, ambitions here in the West. Important fact, however, they overlooked the fact that this council had been canceled all by another council under Photius, which they had in their archives, right? So they just kind of overlooked that somehow. It is interesting to note that later on, Roman Catholics called this this Phocian Council, that's actually not accurate, it's the Eighth Ecumenical Council, uh, the False Eighth Ecumenical Council. So thereby acknowledging it implicitly as another Eighth Ecumenical Council rival to its own choice. And in that way, they reveal that something's going on here that um, they recognize that it was called and understood as an Eighth Ecumenical Council. So very interesting that the, there's a, the Pope who comes after Nicholas condemns his stance. Uh, there was a condemnation of that Latin Eighth Ecumenical Council, that anti Phocian Council, the one they later recognized as the Eighth Ecumenical, by Pope John VIII, is it's it's uh, in a letter that he gave to Emperor Basil, Emperors Basil, Leo, and Alexander. And this letter, which was read at the second session of the Ecumenical Council, Constantinople in 879, the Eighth Ecumenical, and it's included in the second act of, uh, of the minutes. He writes the following, and first of all, let's see, and first of all, receive Photios, the most amazing and most revered high priest of God, our brother patriarch and co-celebrant, who is co-sharer, co-participant, and inheritor of the communion, which is in the Holy Church of the Romans. Interesting that he sees that it's is a co-participant and co-sharer, an inheritor not just another bishop across the other side of the empire. Receive the man unpretentiously. No one should behave pretentiously following the unjust counsels of his predecessors. No one, as it seems right to many who behave like a herd of cows, should use the negative voice of the votes of the blessed hierarchs who precede us, Nicholas, I mean, and Hadrian, as an excuse to oppose him. Since they did not prove what had been cunningly concocted against them. So he says, look, they made a mistake. They were wrong, they condemned him, and they shouldn't have done it. And so do not listen to them. They made a mistake. We're going to reject them. Now, he's being very gracious, uh, but he could, have been, he could have, he's basically rejecting everything they did and their counsel. Everything that was done against him, he said, has now ceased and been banished. So peace in the church, let's move on. In a similar letter, he wrote to Patriarch Photos himself, he says, as for the synod that was summoned against your reverence, we have annulled here and have completely banished and have ejected from it from, from our arch archives. We got rid of it entirely. We don't recognize it at all because of the other causes and because of our blessed uh, predecessor, Pope Hadrian, did not subscribe to it. And so apparently Hadrian did and then did not. But Nicholas certainly was one of the most uh, pre schism, most assertive of papal power over the rest of the church. And he goes on and he says, in chapter 10 of his uh, commentatorium, was read by the papal legates at the third session of the same council. He says, we, Pope John VIII, wish that it is declared before the synod that the synod would take, which took place against the aforementioned patriarch photos at the time of Hadrian, my most, most holy pope in Rome, and the synod in Constantinople should be ostracized from this present moment and be regarded as annulled and groundless and should not be co-enumerated with any other holy synods. So this is the basis for the unity of the, at the time for the, for the end of the hostilities. And it lays down basically a roadmap for the future, which if they had kept it in the West, there would be no schism to this day but they turned their back on it. There is no doubt to anyone who surveys this literature that the Latin position is untenable. In other words, the one that overturned 879. 
Council of 879, the Eighth Ecumenical Council in Hagia Sophia under St. Photius, is that which annulled the Ignatian one, enumerated the seventh, we said, restored unity, and laid down the canonical and theological, here's what's most important here, the theological basis of the union of the church to the East and West through its horos. So it, it implicitly rejects any addition, and of course it has in mind the filioque, because everything that preceded the Eighth Ecumenical Council the, 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 the problems that were created were in Bulgaria among missionaries from the West, the Franks actually coming down and wanting to impose the filioque on Orthodox people in Bulgaria. The Orthodox from Constantinople also had missionaries there. So we know the context is clearly pointing toward uh, the question of the filioque and the council rejects it uh, forcefully. And let's just read quickly a, a portion of the Horos, the decision that's the, the boundary that's what it literally means, oros, right? The, the decision or the um, declaration of the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Jointly sanctifying and preserving intact the venerable and divine teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we expel those who remove themselves from the church and embrace and regard worthy of receiving those of the same faith or teachers of orthodoxy to whom honor and sacred respect is due as they themselves ordered. Thus, having in mind and declaring all these things, we embrace with one mind and tongue and declare to all people with a loud voice the rule or oros of the most pure faith of the Christians, which has come down to us from above through our Holy Fathers, following the Holy Fathers, subtracting nothing, adding nothing, falsifying nothing. For subtraction and addition, when no heresy is stirred up by the ingenious fabrications of the evil one, introduces disapprobation of those who are exempt from blame and inexcusable assault on the fathers. And he goes on, they go on, and they say, thus we think, uh, this is after they've recited the creed without the filioque, right? So they, they recite the creed that has been handed down to them without any addition, because that was anathema. And they declare, thus we think, in the, this confession of faith, we were baptized through this one, the word of truth proved that every heresy is broken to pieces and canceled out. We enroll our, as brothers and fathers and co-heirs of the heavenly city, those who think thus. So you think thus, the meaning is you accept the unadulterated creed of the Holy Fathers. So there's a two part to that, as we all know. It's both the question of obedience and humility and following the Holy Fathers and the actual theological question at stake, which is a, anathema to the church as well as the addition. And he goes on and they go on here and they say, if anyone, however, dares to rewrite and call rule of faith some other exposition besides that of the sacred symbol, which has been spread abroad from above by our blessed and holy fathers, even as far as ourselves, and to snatch the authority of the confession of those divine men and impose on it its own invented phrases. Filioque. That's what they're talking about right here. Evias evrosiologias. And put this forth as a common lesson to the faithful or to those who return from some kind of heresy and display the audacity to falsify completely, to falsify completely the antiquity of the sacred and venerable. There were people at the time and still are who say that, that the uh, Orthodox, that the Eighth Ecumenical Council uh, subtracted the filioque from the creed. That's how absurd and ignorant the people were uh, among the Franks. And so they're saying they're, they're, they're they're making reference here to, uh, you know, the falsification of the uh, creed that has come down to them. And the antiquity of this sacred and venerable orders rule with legitimate, illegitimate words or additions or subtractions, such a person should, according to the vote of the Holy and Ecumenical Synods, which has been already claimed before us, be subjected to complete defraki. If it happens to be one of the clergymen, or be sent away with an anathema if he happens to be one of the lay people. So exactly like the councils before, the Holy Ecumenical Councils, anyone who does not obey is anathematized and the clergy are defrocked. And so this applies to those who have embraced the filioque, which is exactly what they're describing in addition to the creed, which is unwarranted and is uh, anathema. The bishops unanimously agreed and proclaimed we read in the we read in the minutes of the sixth act that after reading the horos, the bishops shouted, Thus we think, thus we believe, into this confession we were baptized and become worthy to enter the priestly orders. We regard, therefore, as enemies of God 
and of the truth, those who think differently as compared to this. If one dares to rewrite another symbol besides this one, or add to it, or subtract from it, or remove anything from it, and to display the audacity to call it a rule, he will be condemned and thrown out of the Christian confession. So not only is the oros there stated, then they say it again, and they say very explicitly, in addition, they obviously have in mind the filioque. For to subtract from or to add to the holy and consubstantial and undivided trinity shows that the confession we have always had to this day is imperfect. So you're implying that we have an imperfect confession when you add the filioque. So obviously they're talking about the Trinitarian. It's a Trinitarian doctrine. What else are we talking about? It's the filioque. It condemns the apostolic tradition and the doctrine of the fathers. So you add the filioque, you condemn the apostolic tradition and the doctrine of the fathers. You're the arrogance that you have in changing this, which has been handed down to us and has been forbidden to change. If one then, having come to such a point of mindlessness as to dare to do what we have said above and to set forth another symbol, call it a rule, or to add or subtract from the one which has been handed down to us, by the first great holy and ecumenical synod of Nicaea, let him be anathema. All right, can we get any clearer? Can we get any clearer, brothers and sisters? What else do we need? Now, it's very important to understand all of that. We, we drove it home because the schism didn't start in 1054. The schism was confirmed and driven home and finalized in 1054. It begins when they introduce the Filioque in 1009 in Rome, and then again in 1014. In 1009, Pope Sergius IV introduces it into the Roman symbol of faith. This is after they've been fighting it in the West. The Romans, the Romans who are of one mind with the East, have been fighting against the encroaching Franks and their mindlessness and their devotion to the Filioque until finally they lose the political battle and uh, the, the city is basically taken over in mind and in, in reality by a foreign a power, a power that's not interested in Romanity, Romeo Sini, uh, and is actually politically opposed to and has been for quite some time uh, the Roman Empire and the, uh, the emperor in Constantinople. Uh, so... We get this from a very, very good book. I have an older edition here. And if anyone wants to be edified and to go deeper into these issues, obviously tonight we're just touching on it. Uh, on the screen, we have the contemporary uh, uh, cover. This is an older version here. You can see, I think, the title, The Christian East and the Rise of the Papacy, Church from 1071 to 1453. He begins looking at this, though, and talks about this in the book. Uh, so this is. Patriarch Sergius II of Constantinople removes the name of Pope Sergius IV in 109. That's a sign of, we no longer commemorate you. We no longer have communion with you. That's what happens when somebody falls into heresy. And he didn't need to call an ecumenical council at this point because he had they had called an ecumenical council and it was very clear the boundaries of the church. They condemned the heresy. They condemned the addition to the creed. So at this point, there's nothing left to do. If you introduce that which is heretical, of course we're going to call and try to work and bring bring about your return, but the communion is, is broken because you've walked away from the church, the confession of the faith. And so he had written a letter. Pope Sergius IV had written a letter to the patriarch, knowing full well that, that he's rejecting the faith that his forefathers had embraced at the Age of the Medical Council. And he says, the filioque in the creed that he sends to, to Constantinople. And so he's gone. He's struck from the diptychs. And in 1014, it's repeated at the coronation of Emperor Henry II, which becomes well known throughout, of course. And only later, 40 years before, it was all before, uh, so another 40 years before the formal lack of communion between East and West was cemented by the anathema. So the anathema has come as an afterthought 40 years later, 40, right? We've had a, we've had a schism now between Moscow and Constantinople that's just a couple years old. 40 years later, what do you think? People are gonna say now the schism started after they haven't had communion for 40 years? No, 
Now it's going to be one more political, you know, uh, declaration, basically, to confirm the rejection of one another. Uh, so this is very important. People are very confused here when they say, oh, 1054, something began, but it really didn't end until the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Crusades. Well, the Crusades certainly sent the message that these people have been totally alienated from the Orthodox faith, that's for sure. They came and started killing and, and pillaging and taking over the, the, the Constantinople, right? So, I mean, that, that even the, la the last, you know, most illiterate person, you can figure out that these people are one with us, right? So, uh, but clearly, here is what here is the date that we need to commemorate. And we would do the same thing today. And when nobody's saying that, well, it's yet to happen, they broke communion between Moscow and Constantinople right now over this question of Ukraine, which, by the way, has happened numerous times throughout church history. But God forbid that it continue because we might turn into something very awful. And that and somebody and schism, as St. Jerome says, ends up and then eventually leading to heresy. So these things are awful and they're of the world and of the devil, but they're not something that strange to church history, unfortunately. But here, why do people say 1054? Why? Obviously, it started earlier. So we need to commemorate that date and understand that it was the filioque, it was the turning the back on the council, then the addition, clearly walking away from the council. And then later on, decades and decades later, they say, oh, well, actually, that's not the council we should commemorate because that condemns us. You know, obviously, they're going to change it. At some point, they're going to change it because it condemns you. When you have the filioque, you're condemned by the council. The mystery that I want answered from some of my Orthodox scholars out there is why, did the, how and why did the Orthodox, in the 20th century anyway, among Western Orthodox thinkers, do, they do not put forth clearly and uh, this history and the Eighth Ecumenical Council. I mean, they do. Thank God, many, many do. But there's, there's some that don't. Uh, they don't know their own history. So now that's as it pertains to the Philoque. We're not actually going to get into the theology of the Philoque. We're going to leave that to a podcast that's going to come up because we're very excited that we're going to be publishing and it's going to come out soon it's done it just needs to be a page layout to be finished and we can go to press and that is the apodictic treaties of saint gregory palamas on the procession uh, of the holy spirit so that's all about the filioque by saint gregory palamas that's going to come out from our press i'm coming out in press and we'll be launching our new website in a few weeks so if you're interested in that text and you're interested in our work, uh, stay tuned and come back to uncommonpress.com. We'll be going live by the end of the month and a uh, number of books coming out uh, as well. So let's go on just a little bit. We're going to touch a little bit on this because it's uh, the one everybody knows about, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I want to just touch on it because it's in this, in this whole Ethiopian Old Council question. Of course, it was there. And Pope Nicholas was trying to assert himself over, over Bulgaria, over Constantinople. He got rejected, right? He got rejected by the council. He got rejected by his own successor. Uh, but it ends up, unfortunately, coming back and with a vengeance after the schism with the reforms, the Gregorian reforms. And they build up and build up and build up the papacy in the West for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Why, that's why I recommend this book here, Christian East and the Rise of the Papacy. Fantastic scholarship. And uh, very, very interesting uh, history and explains what happened. How did this Roman see, Roman meaning in, 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 in the Roman Empire, in communion with the Roman emperor in Constantinople, how did it end up becoming uh, taken over by the Franks and now essentially being, uh, you know, this massive center of, of political and ecclesiastical power? So then it, it, it creates a whole, a lot of false documents to support itself. It uh, changes the ecumenical councils to support itself. It becomes a powerful political center uh, in the West. Uh, it, it has a lot to do with that uh, unfortunate position taken by Pope Nicholas and then, and then picking up, picked up again after the schism, which is this idea that the Pope is primate over the entire, or th over the entire church. He has a jurisdiction and a power over all the other bishops and in fact, contemporary uh, uh, apologists for uh, the papacy and even the fallibility, of course, would say this is essential. It's essential. It's very important. At the end of this podcast, we're going to play two clips uh, from two well-known uh, apologists and teachers of Catholicism in America, Bishop Barron and Scott Hahn, and we'll discuss some of the things they say. 
So this is definitely at the core of their faith and their and their uh, their beliefs uh, today. It's it's uh, unfathomable to think of Catholicism without this uh, infallible and supremely powerful uh, Pope. Wasn't the case, of course, in the first millennium. We're going to talk about that in a new book that's also coming out from our press, which uh, goes in depth about why that's not the case. Well, this is here two or three uh, clips, uh, or rather quotes from this uh, upcoming book, and then we'll talk about the book uh, briefly. So was there a universal primacy of the Pope in the first millennium? We have many historical uh, witnesses to the fact that there was not. And we'll just give you two, and then you can go deeper with the book that, that's coming out soon from our press. It goes into a lot, lot more. In 586, the Bishop Emperor Maurice conferred the title ecumenical on Patriarch John the Faster of Constantinople. And Pope Gregory the Great was alarmed. The title simply meant that John was patriarch of the imperial city, the imperial city. But Gregory took it as meaning that John was proclaiming himself to be the universal bishop of the entire church. Now, modern day Roman Catholics, I'm quoting here from Robert Spencer's book, modern day Roman Catholics might have expected Gregory to write to John and say, the Pope alone was the universal bishop. There's no room in the church for another. Instead, however, Gregory told John, the title itself was illegitimate because there was no universal bishop. This is Pope Gregory the Great, one of the great saints on the sea in Rome. He's saying there's no such thing as a universal bishop. Whoever calls himself universal bishop or desires his title is by his pride the precursor to the Antichrist. This is a Pope of Rome, an Orthodox Pope of Rome saying, don't style yourself as, a, as, the, as the one and only over all the rest. You are a pre precursor to the Antichrist. I don't know what else. Is there, do we need to talk about this any longer? I don't know what else. What else would somebody who is a believer in the sanctity of these great hierarchs like St. Gregory, what else do you need at this point? He goes on. The, Robert Spencer goes on. How could Gregory possibly have written this if he believed that as Pope he had, as Vatican I says, superiority of ordinary power over all other churches, and that this power of jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff, which is truly Episcopal, is immediate. In other words, he is immediate jurisdiction over every diocese and every bishop on the face of the earth. Now, the Roman pontiff possesses the supreme power of governing the universal church. He's the universal bishop. Clearly, Gregory the Great disagreed with this 11th century, with his 11th century successor, Pope Gregory the Eighth, the Seventh, the great reformer, uh, uh, who wrote, "The Roman Pontiff alone can, with right, be called universal." So he turned away from his his predecessor, Saint Gregory, when he said that, and he turned his back on, of course, the Orthodox faith and the Orthodox Church in the same way all the bishops of the uh, of the East. Uh, you know, you're trampling upon your brothers and you're putting yourself first. I thought the Lord said that first shall be last. Last, If you want to be a servant, you want to be my disciple, you have to be a servant. There's many, many, many examples. Of course, there's there's an ex explanation for that, I'm sure, from the apologists of the infallibility and primacy. Now, another example is the case of Pope Leo, Pope Leo III. And in Charlemagne, and he was, of course, in the time of Charlemagne, and he uh, put Charlemagne on the throne and Charlemagne lobbied hard for the addition to the creed because the Franks were the ones who were pushing it all along, not the Romans. In response, Pope Leo publicly declared his opposition to this clause being added to the creed by having the creed without the filioque posted prominently on silver plates in St. Peter's Basilica. So he famously put the original creed on the wall of St. Peter's Basilica. Now we can talk about the question of Filioque later, but right now we're looking at the question of his stance in terms of the council and, and the primacy of his see. Leo said of the plates, I, Leo, put these here for the love and protection of the Orthodox faith. He noted that the ecumenical councils that had formerly of decreed acted upon divine illumination rather than by human wisdom. And far be it from me to count myself 
their equal. So he says, I'm not the equal of the ecumenical council. In other words, I'm not over the ecumenical council. I can't just dismiss the ecumenical council and say, I don't need the ecumenical council. I'm not a universal bishop that is infallible when I speak from uh, S. Cathedra. None of that. You don't see any of that here. Pope Leo III apparently did not hold the later papal view that the popes are above ecumenical councils. And that is basically uh, the view of contemporary Catholicism. I'm sure there's a twist and turn from the apologist, but that's the basic view. Now, these two quotes and many, many more are available in an upcoming book by Robert Spencer. He was a Roman Catholic who converted to orthodoxy, and he has a new book coming out from our press, The Church and the Pope. It is 112 pages. It's uh, You see the ISBN there, and it'll be available in July from Uncomathen Press. And he goes through the uh, the saints, St. Saint Clement, St. Saint Ignatius, St. Polycarp, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, St. Cyprian, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Athanasius the Great, St. John Chrysostom, Blessed Augustine, St. Gregory the Great, St. Photios, and many others. And he shows the great cloud of witnesses and their, their understanding of the church and the position and place of the Pope of Rome uh, in the life of the church. Um, we're not going to get into it tonight, but we may in a future podcast. And it's uh, very interesting, to say the least. Uh, and I'll just quickly quote it here uh, without going too far into it. But there is a witness from Pope Gregory the Great, Pope of Rome we just mentioned, in a letter to Evlogios of Alexandria, uh, and you can find it in Book 7, Epistle 40, in which he talks about the Sea of Peter being divided into three. Sea of Peter being not only Rome, but Alexandria and Antioch. And so he clearly does not see Rome as the only inheritor of the Sea of Peter. Now that immediately puts things in a very, very different context than what we hear from the apologists for the Roman supremacy. We hear something similar in a, at a later time uh, from uh, the uh, Pope Leo, uh, but we're not going to get into that tonight. But there are other witnesses and much more, and you can read that in, in uh, The Church and the Pope by Robert Spencer, showing the Catholic, the, the, the wide spectrum of uh, the uh, witness to the Pope's place and the church in the first millennium, uh, which is not uh, that which it is today in Catholicism. Now, <clears throat> I want to get some things that get to some things which people don't pay much attention to, but are very important. And one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight is the question of innovations uh, in in uh, church life, and uh, those kind of innovations happening uh, almost immediately upon the cessation of communion with the Orthodox Church, and. So one of the things we see is that we have a deviation in the West from holy tradition. Already at the time of the Great Schism, the baptism of the Latins came under severe criticism. A ecumenical patriarch uh, wrote on the occasion to Patriarch Peter of Antioch at the time of the schism about the deviations of the Western church from the ancient tradition and included in them the unlawful administration of uh, Baptism and it's very, very important because the mysteries, of course, are at the center of the church, and the they make the the church is made manifest in the mysteries. Problem was the Latin practice of single immersion that had developed in the West, which had been condemned by the ancient canons, and the use of strange new customs as well that were being added uh, at this time. Uh, the renowned canonist Theodore Balsamon argued that Latin baptism based on one immersion ought to be considered as invalid because the case was similar to that of eunomians. We have a canon in the Second Ecumenical Council which specifically says eunomians because they have one immersion uh, into the death of Christ that they must not be accepted. Uh, their baptism has to be rejected. So here we have a witness later on by a great canonist. We have the contemporary witness of the Patriarch of Constantinople. And by we have a witness from the West at the Lateran Council in 1215 that the Orthodox were rebaptizing, were baptizing the uh, Latins because of this diversion and perversion of the mystery of baptism. Now that wasn't universal in the West, 
but people had heard that this was going on and had been blessed and been accepted for quite some time. And so now it's reaching uh, a critical point. Uh, and this dovetails into what we're going to be quoting from, and we see in the very important book, should be well known to a lot of scholars who have studied this issue, after 900 years, this is where I got the title for this podcast tonight, uh, by uh, Yves Congar, uh, the father of Vatican II's ecclesiology, very important scholar of the 20th century. Uh, so the, uh, the, the great uh, uh, ecclesiologist for Catholicism in the 20th century, in his book, says very, very interesting things about this time period that we're looking at, the 10th, uh, rather the 11th and 12th century. This is extremely important to understand what happened and why there was a deep division. From 1075 to 1175, he says the West profoundly altered its piety. Why? Why then and not 975 or 875 or 1375? Right after the schism, Congar says we have a great break. Listen to what he says. A Christian of the 4th or 5th century would have felt less bewildered by the forms of piety current in the 11th century than would his counterpart of the 11th century in the forms of the 12th. So 11th to the 10 hundreds to the 11 hundreds, you see a massive change, a massive disruption, alteration, a break. And what's important here is this happens only in the West, he says. The great break occurred in the transition period from one to the other century. Why? Well, why, why would that happen? There's only one reason. There's only one reason ultimately. This change took place only in the West. Why didn't it happen in the East? Why didn't it happen among the Orthodox? Sometime between the end of the 11th and the end of the 12th century, everything was somehow transformed. That somehow transformed points us to some mis mystery. It's a mystery here. And the mystery is in the realm of our relationship with God. It's in the realm of the spiritual life, right? This profound, and he's talking about piety, forms of piety, he says. This profound alteration of view did not take place in the East, where in some respects, Christian matters are still today what they were then. He says, he says right up to today, right up into the 40s, 50s, and 60s that he's writing, the Orthodox East is the same as it was a thousand years ago, 900 years ago. And what they were in the West before the end of the 11th century. So he clearly is pointing to a common faith, a common experience, a common piety when they were still Orthodox in Rome. And right after that, within 100 years, massive disruption, profoundly altered, profound break with the past, and only in the West. I, I it's phenomenal to read this and, and then to wonder how Kungar at that point didn't turn around and walk to the east immediately. I'm not sure what you can do when you, when you have such an obvious witness and confirmation from such an, a stalwart of contemporary Catholicism and of Vatican II Catholicism, right? One of the fathers of, uh, of Vatican II. He doesn't understand, or maybe he does understand, but for whatever reason, he doesn't make the constant doesn't take it to its obvious conclusion. Now, from 1075 to 1175, he says we have transitions in the West. Let's look at it quickly. There's much more in the book. You can find it free online if you're interested. Uh, transitions in the West. He says from a predominantly essential and exemplarist outlook to a naturalistic one, an interest in existence. So we have a change from the old ways, the old world understanding, right? Essential. Uh, outlook exemplars to a naturalistic one. And by the way, that uh, becomes apparent very quickly in, in the art form. The orthodox iconography is almost immediately lost in the West. That which was common in East and West, the, the Church of Rome supported very much uh, the uh, Seventh Ecumenical Council and defended the, the icons. So what happened that within 200 years, uh, by the 1200s, you pretty much have a transformation in terms of art. And that, that is partly what he's talking about here. From a symbol, a symbol to dialectic, another massive change that people are still talking about today. Uh, and this is a part of what makes the modern world, the Western rationalistic world, is that they left symbol and they embraced the dialectic, right? From a synthetic perception, synthetic, unified, uh, 
perception to an inclination for analysis questions, putting things under the microscope, right? And analyzing them rationalistically. And he says here, we have the beginning of scholasticism. Very interesting. Right then, right then at the end of the, at the time of the schism. It's already set almost immediately. From a culture where tradition reigned and the habit of synthesis became ingrained to an academic milieu, where continual questioning and research was the norm and analysis the normal result of study. All right, so totally different. Why do we have a very different way of understanding the life in Christ and theology and orthodoxy compared to Catholicism in the West? Um, you know, there's this is not an accident. There's it has to do with a break from the life of the church, a walking away from the unity of the church and all that that entails, including that what it entails in, with respect to the grace of God. And it's not an accident, as we'll see later, that they end up talking about grace as a created reality. That grace, which is uncreated, which is God alone, as we'll see, talk later on about it is created reality. Why? How's it possible? Well, here's a one of the things that leads there. The whole change in, in mentality in the West within 100, 120, 150 years. The East followed the road of tradition. This is Congar writing. The East followed the road of tradition. Interesting. And we have shown how one of the principal differences among the various peoples of the Orthodox faith is in fact that they are not trained, as are the Latins, by the schools. Right? And that's very true. When, really until the 19th and 20th century, when you have an explosion of, of, of an imitation of the West in terms of academic theology in our schools or Orthodox sources, but even then, the saints reject that. The saints reject that. Let's look at St. Paisius Veliskovsky in the 18th century. He goes to theological school in Kiev and walks out within a couple of months and says, this is, this is a dead end. This is not Orthodoxy. This is not the, the patristic theology I want. He leaves from Mount Athos, the center of the church for the last thousand years. He leaves from Mount Athos because that's not how it's done. That never was how it's done. We didn't have the theology was not a matter of rational analysis, but of experience, of prayer, right? So he's, that's what he's telling us here. Well, God is saying this is what was going on in the, in, among the Orthodox. They weren't interested in cultivating excessively like philosophers, the rational intellect. They were interested in experiencing God firsthand. And from that experience then flowed rivers of theology, right? He says the, new, the East knew no scholasticism of its own and was to experience neither the Reformation or the 16th and 18th century rationalism. All those stages of the Renaissance and the, the so-called Enlightenment, which was the darkening of the West, and all these things didn't happen in the East, didn't happen among the Orthodox. We're, gonna get, we're getting it basically uh, shoved down our throat for the last 200 years, especially after the Russian Revolution, it's been violently imposed upon the Orthodox peoples uh, by, by forced assimilation, by, by bayonet and gunpoint under the Russian Revolution and all the rest, right? Through persecution and decimation of the church. And it ha it's, it's this tight, tyrannical spirit of the West of rationalism and pride that took over the West, after, especially after the Enlightenment, now has been forced upon the whole world, this one way of thinking and living. He's telling us right here that that's that's this is where it is the uh, the onset. This is the origin of all this. In other words, the East remained foreign to the three influences that shaped modern Catholicism. We could talk all the day about minor differences, and most people who looked at Orthodoxy and look at Catholicism, that's what they do. Oh, well, I, what do I, I wonder if the Pope is right. If the Pope's right, then I'll become Roman Catholic. You're missing that. You're missing it. You're missing it. It's not on that level. It's much deeper. We've got to understand the deeper differences and the deeper life and how different the life is in Christ to understand then in the proper context these dogmatic additions in the West uh, and the dogmatic differences and of stances today. So, in other words, again, the East remained foreign to the three influences that shape modern Catholicism. And the question is, why did they shape modern Catholicism? Where do they come from? He tells us right here. It's this time period when things start to change in the West. And why do they start to change? It's pretty obvious. They start to change because they walked away from the unity and the theology and the experience of the church of the first millennium. 
The West chose rationalism over hesychasm. What's hesychasm? Hesychasm is the way of the hesychast, of the ascetics, the way of, the, uh, of those who go deep in prayer and unite themselves to God in the church. That's the core of the Orthodox Church, the hesychast, the one who, who is in the stillness, the stillness of God, like it came to the prophet Elias in the Old Testament, the still small voice, that, 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 that stillness is where we encounter God and we go deep and we become true theologians. The West chose rationalism, the, this thing, to develop this thing excessively and think that by developing this thing, we're going to reach God. In fact, this is what, the, when you develop this excessively, you become proud and arrogant. It's the opposite of what you need to do to reach God, right? Uh, it certainly is a tool, a very powerful tool. We use it all the time. But it's one thing to have that at the center and at the, at the forefront and for that to be trained and developed and, and, and built up and for the soul and the spirit and the heart to be built up. It's not the same thing, right? So the West, he says, chose rationalism over uh, the monastic uh, life, the ascetic life. He says, therefore, the West has evolved towards a type of analytical knowledge, which in some is rational. Rationalism. It needs to define the exact shape of things, to see them independently of one another. It's an, an analytical stance. Divide them, analyze them, compartmentalize them. None of that is what was going on in the first millennium. And it goes on in the Orthodox Church, right? In the first half of the 13th century, or should, right? We're, we're, all, we're all under the weight of rationalism today everywhere. In the first half of the 13th century, a new kind of theological teaching and study appeared and established itself in the West. He's talking about scholasticism. Until this time, the dominant type of teaching or study had been of a contemplative or monastic nature, linked with the liturgical life of the abbeys and cathedrals. <clears throat> now there was added a new type of teaching and study, an academic and rational nature, of an academic and rational nature, which was soon to take the place of the former. So it didn't coexist. There, it's tyrannical, the rationalistic spirit. It does not allow for those who live according to the spirit. They're at war with one another. And unfortunately, in the West, they succumb to that. And he says it right there, not me but the father of the Second Vatican Council's ecclesiology. So that is huge. I think anybody who is serious about understanding the difference between orthodoxy and Catholicism needs to understand what we just went over. Now, the fruits of it were on multiple levels, and I'm going to point out three different things which might seem minor but are very indicative of the dissolution. What we saw in the West was continual dissolution until today, right? A, a pendulum swing which never could stay on the royal path, going from one extreme to another, reaction to reaction. And that's exactly why you had, a, uh, you had a Protestant Reformation, because you had an extreme in terms of papal authority, an extreme in terms of centralization and all the rest, and you had a reaction, but you had also a drying up of the monastic life and the ascetic life in the West, uh, according to the Hesychastic ancient fathers, right? You had, of course, lots of activity, and even monastic orders, but that's not the same thing as having the ancient monastic life as it was lived in the church. So just three little, little examples taken from my, <clears throat> my book, uh, The Ecclesiological Renovation of Vatican II, which is an examination of Vatican II's uh, documents on the church and on, especially on baptism. So if you're interested in that, you can pick that up at orthodox, uh, I'm sorry, uncomeoutandpress.com. And this, these are excerpts from the book. So there was, first of all, after the schism and up until the Council of Trent, systematically an abandonment of a basic teaching in the Orthodox Church, the pre-schism church. And that is that a priest and a member of the church must baptize. So with respect to the minister of the ministry of the mystery of baptism, it must be noted that from at least the fourth Lateran Council, there ceased to be a distinction between believer and unbeliever in the performance of baptism in case of need. That is, the Roman Catholic Church claimed that the right of any person whatsoever to baptize in case of necessity is in accord with the constant tradition and practice 
of the church. Any person could be an unbaptized, an unbeliever, a Jew, a Muslim. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 defended heretical baptism, teaching that the mystery of baptism rightly conferred by anyone in the form of the church is useful to under salvation for little ones and for adults. And with the decree for the Armenians in the Council of Florence, it explicitly says, in case of necessity, not only a priest or a deacon, but even a layman or a laywoman, may even a pagan or a heretic may confirm baptism. So there's a total dissolution and disassociation of the need for one to be initiated and to have the, the grace of the successor of the apostles in order to impart the baptism. Where do you see that in the church? Now, it's one thing to have that become <coughs> a basic pillar of the teaching here. Another thing for there to be emergency baptisms in a hospital by a nurse, right? So let's not confuse things. And then in the Orthodox Church, that baby would be baptized if it lived to be baptized in a proper way by a priest. So uh, that's neither here nor there. The exception is not the case here. We're talking about a change of teaching about what, do you need to be initiated to initiate someone? No, you can be a pagan. You don't have to believe in Jesus Christ. And you can initiate someone into the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a uh, very disturbing diversion, but it continues. There's a disintegration of the, in, of the unity of the mysteries in the West during this time period. Centuries before the Council of Trent, the unity of rites of initiation in Rome and the West had been broken up into entirely separate rites. As you all know, if you're Orthodox, initiation takes place, baptism, chrismation, and communion all together, no matter what age you are. You could be a baby of five days, but you're going to be baptized, immediately chrismated, and immediately communed. So those all three are together. Very important. Well, that did not happen. That, dissol that was dissolved in the West. So for infants who were the vast majority, the threefold initiation of baptism, chrismation, called confirmation in the West, and the Eucharist was replaced by a partial initiation in baptism alone to be followed years later with Holy Communion and confirmation and, and chrismation and confession. And there's much more to the story. The Lopin read, Wrote, writ, written on this topic in the 20th century by the uh, Lutheran scholars, Cat Roman Catholic scholars, and it's showing and admitting that they departed from the ancient practice, departed from that which is done in the Orthodox Church to this day. And it's a tragic, tragic development because, of course, it opens the door for further dissolution and eventually to the Vatican II ecclesiology, which now dissolve the church's boundaries and identity and people can be participating within the Roman Catholic Church. This is their perception of things without ever communion of the Eucharist, without ever confessing the faith of their church. People can now become partial, partially initiated, partial Christians, I suppose. I'm not really sure. The partial enjoyment of the grace of God as they see it. And so it's not it didn't stop in the Middle Ages. They, on the basis of this disintegration and, and not disunity, then they started to think about initiation as simply a baptism and not chrismation, not communion. You could be in the church just with baptism. That's That was the case, right? Because you would later on, you would commune. Later on, you would confess. Later on, you would uh, be chrismated. So you're just a baptized human being. That's all. And you're in the church. So then, then they have this perception of Vatican II. Well, well, then Protestants are in the church and all kinds of other people are in the church. They don't have to be in, in the, 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 the recognizable, you know, concrete reality of the church. They can be in the, in the heretical or the heterodox version of the church. It's, it's a tragedy that has now exploded after Vatican II uh, and dis, is, is showing itself in the dissolution uh, and the, uh, the exodus, unfortunately, of many, many people from contemporary Catholicism. <coughs> The delay in confirmation, chrismation we, we call it in the Orthodox Church, for practical or other reasons, and the decline and eventual disappearance of infant communion for the variety of theological and spiritual reasons meant that infant initiation eventually became infant baptism. What the earlier churches of both East and West kept together in a unity of an integral rite, the Middle Ages, the Western Middle Ages, rent asunder into four separate and distinct sacraments. Baptism, first confession, first communion, and confirmation. Of course, they're different mysteries, but they're united in terms of initiation. 
The acceptance and the persistence of this unity profoundly altered the understanding of initiation into the church. I'm quoting various scholars. If you're interested, you can pick up the book and you can see all my sources. Finally, from this, uh, in this segment of our podcast tonight, we're going to look at what happened to baptism. It, it, it ended in the West. And of course, we mean the word, what the word means, and that's immersion. That's the word. That's what it means, to immerse. The ancient practice of baptism as the norm was, by the end of the Middle Ages, replaced by a fusion, pouring, and more exceptionally, aspersion, sprinkling. The exception of a fusion in cases of emergency gradually replaced baptism as the rule. The universality of a fusion, pouring, reached its peak by the end of the 19th century, when the authorized ritual of the Latin Church mandated that baptism must be performed by a washing of the head of the candidate. I mean, there are cases where people are very rarely immersed. There are some priests who want to try to get back to the tradition, but 99% of the people, according to my reading and my understanding, are simply have water poured over their forehead. This change in baptismal practice is neither a minor aspect of the process of disintegration into sacramental minimalism, nor unrelated to the new ecclesiology of Vatican II. When, since the 13th century, Latin baptism, by omitting immersion, had destroyed that correspondence between outward act and inward meaning, which is essential to the nature of a sacrament. I'm quoting a scholar here of contemporary uh, Vatican II ecclesiology, theology, and he's saying that's what happens when you walk away from immersion. You're destroying the correspondence between the outward act and the inward meaning. And this is a message to all of us Orthodox out there, our priests who think it doesn't matter, who've been brainwashed by the practice around them of the Latins and the Protestants and all the rest. Listen to what a Latin theologian is saying about what happens when you don't immerse. You destroy the correspondence and the meaning. The outward act and the inward meaning is essential. It's essential to the nature of the sacrament. Now he goes on and makes excuses why that's possible, but he says it. And so this cannot but undermine the general perception of what constitutes initiation into the church, and therefore also the boundaries of the church. This is directly related to the ecclesiology and to the belief of the boundaries. What happened to the boundaries now if this is no longer essential, right? For when the mystery of initiation as originally consisting of the unity of three mysteries, is reduced to one mystery, and that gutted of theological symbolism, such that it is a mere shadow of its original fullness, the criterion of membership in the body is also reduced to the least common denominator. The external form of the mystery combined with the necessary, necessary matter and a good intention on the part of anyone, anywhere. So it's all related, brothers and sisters. They allow pagans to baptize. They strip it down to just water over the head. Uh, they, uh, they disunify uh, all the mysteries. And what you've left now, to become a Christian, you have a little water poured over by a pagan. And he says the words, and he has the intention of making you an initiate into the body of Christ. What does that have to do with what we see in the Acts of the Apostles, or with what we see in the early church? Uh, it's, uh, it's a tragedy. And I hope that our goodwill brothers and sisters who are searching for orthodoxy will realize that this is, and this is indicative of a dissolution of theology and life of unity. Uh, this is what it means to baptize. These are pictures from an orthodox baptism of children. Some of these just within the last couple of years here in North America. And this is what it means to baptize adults in the orthodox church. And all those Orthodox who are departing from this are departing from Orthodoxy, and this is not a small matter. Now, let's move on to the spirituality. So we're by the time we get in a couple hundred years into the schism, we start to see some strange developments in terms of spirituality. Of course, this is the first thing that's lost when you walk away from the unity of the church. You lose the spirit of God and the discernment of spirits. And the discernment of spirits. This is lost. That's the number one characteristic of the church and the saints. They discern the spirits. And therefore, they're not led astray in the delusion. And unfortunately, we see signs of a deluded, deluded and unorthodox, non-patristic spirituality in the life, as it's come down to us, of Francis of Assisi. And I'm just going to touch on a few points. There's much more. 
And you can go, you can see the links that I'm, I've got down here at the bottom of my little card. You can find that online. Uh, it's a, it's a um, well, this is from uh, Why Orthodox is the True Faith by Osipov. Uh, that's at uh, St. John of Baptist, St. John the Baptist uh, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church in uh, website in Washington, D.C. But this uh, text is uh, elsewhere. And the one that we're going to talk about most is this uh, uh, in a minute is um, in a comparison of Francis of Assisi and St. Sarah from Osera, which is also available online. So one of the many things that is problematic in the life of Francis of Assisi from an Orthodox perspective, uh, and of course he's, you know, likable and his love of the people and all the rest is very uh, impressive and all the rest, but we're not talking about simply um, you know, sentimentality and good feelings and all the rest. We're talking about, is this the patristic way? Is this the way of the Holy Fathers, the narrow way, the way of the ascetics? Is this what's come down to us, is testified as uh, and, and, and a, akin to what we see in the lives of the great ascetics? So that's our standard, right? St. Saint, Saint Isaac of Syria, St. Nihilus, and all the rest that we're going to quote. They, they have clear demarcation line and uh, as, as to the way of the ascetics, and we see that this is the, uh, you know, the opposite in some cases in terms of Francis of Assisi. So one of the things Francis of Assisi says, and you have to read the articles, and of course, wouldn't be a bad idea if you're really interested to read the life and then look at the patristic teaching. But he says, during my prayer, two great lights appeared before me. One in which I recognize the creator and another in which I recognize myself. And that is attested to in his life as words that he applied, as recorded as applying to himself. He is one of the great lights along with the creator. So that's a little problematic from an Orthodox perspective. What Francis set forth for himself as the goal of life is quite telling. I have labored and want to labor because this brings honor. This brings honor. Francis wishes to suffer for others and to atone for other sins. And this is in, the, in, his, in his life. Was this not the reason for his flatly stating at the end of his life, I am not aware of any transgressions. I have not redeemed through confession and repentance. And this is a very curious statement for us as Orthodox Christians. It's a very different spirit than we're used to seeing in our saints. Uh, it actually would bear witness to a failure to see his sins. Not that he doesn't have them, but that he doesn't see them. And we see the same, we see this teaching in the life of St. Sisoyas, the great ascetic from the Egyptian desert, who's in the life, who's in the uh, collection of the, of the uh, sayings and the lives of the Desert Fathers. And we see in his life the following. In the minutes before his death, as Sisoyas appeared to be talking with persons invisible to the brethren surrounding him, he responded to the request, Father, tell us with whom you are conversing by saying they are the angels who have come to take me and I am imploring them to leave me here for a short time so that I may repent. And the brethren who knew that Sisoyas was accomplished in virtues, they contradicted him and said, but you have no need of repentance, Father. And he answered, in truth, I do not know whether I have even begun to repent. I do not know if I've even begun to repent. And just compare that with the idea that I've arrived and I have no more sins and I've, I've been forgiven all of them and I've confessed them all. And that's a very, very almost diametrically opposed spirit and understanding. So this profound understanding, this recognition of one's own imperfection is the principal distinguishing character of all true saints. All true saints are gonna have that characteristic. In the West, now this is from a comparison, very interesting text if you wanna go into this examination of the differences in spiritual life and spiritual understanding. There's a comparison, Francis of Assisi and Seraphim of Sarov, uh, by George Macris, and it's over at Pravmir, and it's on orthodoxinfo.com. So very interesting. I recommend it highly if you've never examined these things. The image here you see on the left is, is from a, a, a painting of France of Assisi receiving the stigmata, stigmata, depending on what language you're talking, 
Uh, and that is the signs, uh, 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 physical signs of the crucifixion. In other words, in his hand and in his feet, he uh, had the, uh, he's one of the first uh, to have this happen to him where they, the blood would run in the, si in the, in the uh, hands and feet where uh, the Lord was crucified. And you see there this vision that he had of the Lord appearing with angel wings and and the uh, stigmata being communicated given to uh, Francis. So this is a very unique and under, strange for us as Orthodox. We never heard of this, never saw this in the first millennium, never saw it since. And so this is something unique to Catholicism and more or less began with Francis of Assisi. In the West, the spiritual leaders of the time reacted to Francis' stigmatization with the greatest reverence. So no one stood up and said, this is crazy. This is insane. We've never seen this before. This is not the patristic way. This is a sign of delusion. Nobody said that. Everybody said, this is amazing. This is a... They accepted the phenomenon as a great miracle. Two years after his death, two years. That never happens in the Orthodox Church. I mean, I, it's not that it can't, but it's, I guess, Extremely, extremely strange for that to happen. In two years, the Pope canonized Francis as a saint. The chief motive for his canonization was the fact of the miraculous stigma on his person. So they it's like incorrupt relics, maybe. You know, that's a sign for the Orthodox. Uh, always has been an amazing sign. We have St. Spiridon from the 4th century, whose relics are still incorrupt to this day, and we have many, many, many more. So when we see that, we say this is a sign. Of course, it has to go along with a holy life and a confession of faith and all the rest. It's not, uh, uh, can never be separate from that. But they saw this as something, you know, akin to an automatic sign of, of, uh, of, of holiness. And the fact, this fact is of singular interest to the Orthodox Christians since nothing similar has ever been encountered in the lives of our saints. Stigmatization of Francis of Assisi due to his to the results of his vision are ascribed to a singular prayer. The prayer is an intense pleading on his part that he may experience the sufferings of Christ in his body and soul. In the prayer, Francis desires divine instigation of the experience and thirst to experience this not just with his soul but with his body. And thus surrendering himself to ecstatic prayer, he did not denounce his body, but was inviting earthly or bodily sensations, physical suffering. Francis' prayer was answered. The Chronicle says that Francis felt himself completely transformed into Christ. If you're listening, how does that sound to you? Does that sound right? Francis felt himself completely transformed into Christ. This transformation... It's one thing spiritually to have to become, uh, it's Christ who lives in me. Another thing to be transformed entirely, and we're talking about a physical thing here, right? An external thing into Christ. This transformation was not only in spirit, but also in body, not only in spiritual and psychological sensations, but also in physical ones. So it made its manifest through the st stigmata or stigmata. So this, these are huge red, uh, red lights, you know, uh, signs going off here, bells ringing. In an orthodox context, orthodox spiritual life, that this is not right. There's something wrong here. We don't seek that kind of. We don't imitate Christ like that. We don't try to become like Christ. That's a, uh, extremely problematic, uh, and and would be considered extremely arrogant. Let's hear what come of some of our great ascetic saints have to say about this in particular. All the things Francis experienced in the process of his stigmatization are the very beguilements the church fathers repeatedly warned against. So there's just, you know, the church, if he had a spiritual father, that it was a guide, an orthodox spiritual father, he would have said, no, 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 ignore that. No, no, don't pray for that, right? He didn't have that. <clears throat> Recalling how the ascetics of the orthodox church understand the highest spiritual prayer as detailed in the Philokalia, it is to be emphasized here that they regarded this prayer alongside their own personal strivings as a synergetic operation. In other words, synergy, cooperation, man cooperating with God to achieve detachment, detachment, not only from everything physical or sensory, but also from rational thought. All right, we don't, when we pray, we want to pray with a pure, clean mind and not be distracted by the rational thoughts. That is, at best, 
a direct spiritual elevation of the person to God when the Lord God, the Holy Spirit himself, intercedes for the supplicant with groanings which cannot be uttered, as according to St. Paul. So as an example, we have St. Isaac of Syria in his directions say, he says, a soul which loves God and in God and in him alone finds peace. First release yourself from all your outward attachments, then your heart will be able to unite to, with God. For union with God is, is preceded by detachment from matter. The, the opposite of what we saw happening in Francis of Assisi. It is the plain speaking of sight, Nihilus of Sinai, however, that slashes through the, with distinct clarity to present a serious juxtaposition to Francis' experience. He says in the text on prayer, Never desire nor seek any face or image during prayer. Do not wish for sensory vision or angels or powers or Christ, lest you lose your mind by mistaking the wolf for the shepherd and worship the enemies, the demons. The beginning of the beguilement, the, the delusion, plani, of the mind is vainglory, which moves the mind to try and represent the deity in some form or image, all right? So to represent the deity in some form or image, that's vainglorious, according to the saint. And that's, the, avoid that at all costs. Do not imagine, do not try to, to, to see with a century vision, even Christ himself. We do not seek that. So that is, that's, that's just a taste. We're gonna go on here to the teaching on created grace. But that is a taste here for all of us, and we can go on. There's, there's much written on this, uh, and, and many other, uh, several other prominent um, uh, Latin and medieval saints who had similar experiences and are red flags going off everywhere from the Orthodox perspective. We have that uh, as a witness to a major problem that, that occurs in the West after the schism from the Orthodox perspective. But that just gives you a small taste of, of, of um, the problems that have occurred uh, for, orthodox, for spirituality in the West compared to the patristic ascetic way. Now, there is a teaching found in the writings of theologians like Thomas Aquinas, generally accepted that grace is not only uncreated, it's created. That it's, it is, we can speak of a created grace. Right? Of course, it's uncreated, but then it becomes created, takes on create, created form, all the rest, among uh, theologians in the West. And I want to read to you, because it's not in English, it's, I just translated for this podcast tonight, a small excerpt from uh, the uh, very, very important book by Professor Dimitrios Chalengidis. If you read Greek, you can see the title here, I think. Uh, and that is um, the presuppositions and criteria of theolog theologizing in an orthodox manner without delusion, all right? So very important uh, te text we hope we can translate and publish someday. Now the teaching that grace is created, he's gonna address this and its tragedy, what it means from an orthodox perspective, what it means if you teach this, uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not true. Grace is never created, can never be created. Uh, it would cease to be grace if it is created. It is God himself in his divine energies. The reason why they talk about created grace in the West is because they've lost the patristic teaching on divine energies uh, and the experience of the divine energies, apparently, because otherwise they would understand experientially, not just theoretically or scholastically, why you can't talk about created grace. In characterizing the grace of the holy mysteries, Professor Chalinghidi says, as created, Catholicism literally empties the holy mysteries of their theological and spiritual character. That is, the mysteries emptied of the presence of divinity of the Holy Spirit. In this way, however, that which the Roman Catholics considered to be mysteries are revealed as powerless soteriologically. If you speak of created grace, then you do not have something that's going to save you. They become powerless. For, so, for salvation. That's what the professor is saying. In rejecting the uncreated and divine, divinizing character of the divine grace in the mysteries, Roman Catholics essentially reject the very character of the church, the body of Christ, the mysteries themselves, but also the aim of its existence, why the church exists, right? If this is where we arrive, and of course, 
many will say, no, 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 we don't arrive there. But the implications, it's one thing to, it's, what, it's one thing to not want that or not agree with that, but what they're teaching, that's the implication. So we have a breakdown here. And what's important is that if we, if we arrive to teach something that's false, that means our experience is somehow corrupted. Apparently in this, the Roman Catholics, he goes on to say, are entirely frank. They express theologically that which they live existentially. In the mysteries, they do not see and apparently do not taste anything uncreated that is anything divine. Now, I am sure there are people watching who say that's not true. I have experience of grace. I feel the grace of God, I feel sanctification. And I, I cannot speak to anybody's subjective experience, but theologically, the implication of what's said when we say created grace implies what the professor is saying. And it, it, it does uh, create a lot of problems for any kind of reconciliation with orthodoxy for Roman Catholicism if that is not rejected, right? We have a serious problem. We're essentially going to be coming under the condemnation because uh, <clears throat> this goes along with other teachings of like mind. Uh, we're going to become come close to the condemnation of the Ninth Ecumenical Council uh, with St. Gregory Palamas, and we're going to be uh, associating with Barlamites and, and the and the uh, the rationalists uh, who fought against St. Gregory Palamas, but that is for another podcast. Uh, I'm not going to be going too much deeper on that. We're going to move on to the question of the infallibility now of the Pope, and we don't have much time. We've already been going now for an hour and a half. I want to get to some contemporary interviews and just talk about them. I think that'll be very interesting for everyone. But one or two more slides or three more slides here about the infallibility of the Pope. So many Roman Catholics will say, no, 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 don't misunderstand us. We don't mean he walks around and everything he does is infallible, God forbid. And here is a, a, a from, uh, uh, I think it's Catholic Answers, there is a correcting mis misconceptions on papal infallibility. You see in the middle of the screen here. Infallibility, they say, is only conferred on papal pronouncements which are solemnly and dogmatically defined and does not apply to remarks made by the Pope as a private individual or even as a priest or the Bishop of Rome or the Pope, etc. Only when he speaks as the Pope ex cathedra, literally from the chair, meaning that he is formally defining something as infallible, is infallibility invoked. Such instances are very rare indeed far rarer than many non-Catholics think. So this apparently is an attempt to say, hey, don't worry too much about this teaching that is really offensive to you because it doesn't really happen that often. And it's only in this really rare thing and it's really special. But unfortunately, that doesn't save it because if it happens once and never happens again, it's still an offensive teaching to the extreme. And let's hear St. Eustin Bobovich who has written on this in a most powerful way. In two slides, let's hear what he has to say. This is from the Orthodox Church and Ecumenism. What's wrong with this infallibility idea? Why is it not able to be reconciled with the theanthropic, uh, incarnational uh, uh, teaching and reality of the, of the Church of God? It's impossible to reconcile these things. Because we, we depart from... Uh, God, God, humanity, and we, we're simply now in the realm of humanism. Let's hear what uh, St. Eustine has to say. There's no place for the God-man here. There's no place for the theanthropos, right? The God-man here. For this reason, in the humanistic kingdom, the place of Christ, the God-man, is now taken by the Vicarios Christi. And the God-man is banished to heaven. This is surely a kind of de-incarnation of Christ, the God-man. De-incarnation of Christ. St. Eustine, by the way, one of the greatest dogmatic theologians in the Orthodox Church of the 20th century, if not the greatest, uh, he produced numerable texts. One of them is this massive tome uh, right there. You can see it. It's in Greek. Let's see if we can get that on the screen. That is St. Eustine's dogmatic theology. And unfortunately, it doesn't exist in English yet. This is a thousand fifty pages of unbelievable wisdom and insight. So Saint Eustine is coming here and saying that the whole theology at the heart of the church, which is the incarnation and the theanthropos, 
this is a de-incarnation of this. I no more, there's no more understanding here of the synergy of the body of Christ, the people of God with Christ. We now have a human who has this charism supernaturally only alone, no longer the body, no longer the body together, but just him standing and he is infallible by the appropriating through the dogma of infallibility of all the power and rights belonging solely to Christ, the God man. Infallibility only belongs to the God man, to the body of Christ in council with the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the God man speaking, right? That's the Theanthropos. Now we have this, these rights, this ability to be taken away from the body and given to one man. And now he says, without the church, if so, so necessary, right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to have the, he doesn't have the agreement of the rest of the body. He's going to stand there and be alone. And he's going to be as a man now infallible. He's going to have that which belongs only to God, only to the, the theanthropic body, Christ. He is the church. Christ is the church. So all the power which belong exclusively to Christ, the God-man. Now the Pope, a man, has in fact, by this act, proclaimed himself a church within the Papist church and has become all-powerful in it. So he's now a church within the church. He has become his own version of the upholder of all things, right? He now has that given to him. A little bit longer, a more extensive quote by St. Eustine. You have an icon of him here on the left. By the way, today is his feast day. Today, the 14th, the first on the church calendar, is the great uh, the feast of the great uh, theologian. We're very honored to be able to honor him in this way today on his feast day. He says, man in general has ultimately been pronounced infallible by the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope. Man. So, again, it's not, it's very rationalistic the way that the uh, apologists for uh, for Catholic answers were looking at a very narrow, very realistic, legalistic. This is now a man. This the implications are grave. It doesn't matter what man. It's a man who now has this infallibility. Hence, there is an infinite number of popes throughout Europe, both in the Vatican and in Protestantism. Uh, this is an old teaching of the Orthodox that the, that the, we have two kinds of Protestantism. We have a papal Protestantism and we have a reformed Protestantism. But the Pope is the first Protestant, according to Orthodox We're going to actually quote one of them. There's no substantial difference between them, for papism was the first Protestantism. According to the words of the truth discerning Komiakov, Alexei Komiakov, he was one of the so called Slavophile theologians in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, he's actually he's actually uh, referenced in that book by Yves Congar, uh, and he's saying that the critique of the Slavophiles on us is precisely that we had we have lost uh, that which which was in the first millennium, and that uh, that perception, that integral thinking, uh, and the symbolism and all the rest. He said, and that, he says this is the criticism that they're making. Like somebody like Komikov is making. So Komikov was extremely perceptive, and St. Saint U- Saint Eustine is quoting him here. Uh, papism was the first Protestantism. Infallibility is a natural theanthropic characteristic and function of the church as the theanthropic body of Christ, whose eternal head is the truth. He is the head, not the Pope, not any bishop. He is the head. It's his body. We are his members. He, together with us, the theanthropic body, is infallible, right? Whose eternal head is the truth, the the supreme truth, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the theanthropos, Jesus Christ. By the dogma of infallibility, the Pope was, in fact, proclaimed to be a church, and he, a man, took the place of the God-man. This was the final triumph of humanism, the final triumph of humanism in the West. It was also through the second, though the second death. It was also though the second death. He's talking about. He's referring to the Book of Revelation here, of papism, the spiritual death, and through it of every humanism. But according to the truth, the true Christ, Church of Christ that has existed since the advent of Christ, the Theanthropos, 
in this world as his theanthropic body, the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope is not only a heresy, but the ultimate heresy. It's not only heresy, it's the ultimate heresy. No other ecumenistic heresy has so radically and so comprehensively risen against Christ the Theanthropos and his church as papism has through but the dogma of the infallibility of the Pope, a man, right? So there's nothing like this. This is the extreme, extreme in terms of departure from the theanthropic uh, body of Christ. This is un undoubtedly the heresy above all heresies. It is the ho horror, horror above all horrors, it is an unseen rebellion against Christ, the God-man. It is, alas, the most dreadful banishment of the Lord Christ from the earth. It is the repeated betrayal of Christ, the repeated crucifixion of the Lord Christ, not on a wooden cross this time, but on the golden cross of papist humanism. All this is hell thrice over for the wretched earthly being called man. I mean, you can't get much powerful than that here. This is one of the... Now, why am I sharing this people who might be interested in Orthodoxy? Maybe some Roman Catholics here tonight, and they're interested. What does the Orthodox Church have to say about Catholicism? I'm sharing this because at the heart of the Orthodox Church in the 20th century, this saint holds prime place. And I want you to know that they're not telling you the truth all the time. Online, some of the political figures in the church or the ecumenist or the, the kind of superficial orthodox who don't know what they're talking about. This saint is revered throughout the orthodox church and his wisdom has been embraced by the church. They have declared him a saint and his writings have been translated in many languages. As I showed you here, his uh, dogmatic text has been translated into Greek and now it's being translated into English. So this is at the heart, this, this man, this theologian, this saint is expressing the heart of the church, which is the Theantipos. Christ is all in all in the Orthodox Church. It's absurd and a blasphemy to put a man and call him infallible when that infallibility is only when the full Christ, God-man, the God-man is present. And that means his whole body with him at the head. That's, that's the Theanthropic um, nature of the church. It's, it's, so it's a it's a heresy of heresies for the Orthodox. Now we've arrived at uh, at this uh, video uh, that I saw, very short video, but I thought I'll try my best. Maybe I'm tiring you by now. It's 142, but we're going to go through this quickly. It's not very long, and then we're going to comment on it. These are the these are the words of uh, <clears throat> of the bishop, which we'll come back and we'll we'll talk about. But I'm going to I'm going to play the video. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've not. This is Bishop Barron, a pretty well-known apologist for the uh, for Catholicism, and why the Orthodox Church is not the true church. And here's the question. What What is like your number one reason why you think that the Catholic Church, or the Roman Catholic Church, is the true church and not the Eastern Orthodox? Well, the, again, the main difference there would not be sacramental, not be the priesthood or the Eucharist. It would be the, the primacy of the Pope. And I see that as a great gift. Um, and I'm, I'm a follower of John Henry Newman, that there is a living voice of authority to determine and adjudicate disputes that come into the life of the church. That's indispensably important. And from a Catholic perspective, the appeal simply to the Bible, let's say a, a more classically Protestant move, or even an appeal to the church fathers, it might be closer to a Orthodox move. Um, those are appeals to texts or to distant figures. Um, the appeal to a living voice I can, we can get on a plane, you and I, and we can fly to Rome and I'll, I'll bring up, here's the successor of Peter. Uh, here's the one who has the final authority to adjudicate these uh, matters in the body of Christ. That's a gift to me and a grace. That, and that's, the, I think, the main point of demarcation between the two. So we've, let me just stop here and, and comment on that because I think it's important before we, uh, we go on. Let me, uh, so... I don't think we need the text, actually. So he says here that um, the living voice of the Pope uh, is a great gift, and we can go and we can actually talk to him, and he is the, uh, the one who's the final authority in the church <clears throat> to educate the, uh, ad adjudicate these matters in the body of Christ. And, of course, the appeal to a living authority is not 
at all problematic, but we don't see that in the, first of all, we see that in church history that it's an appeal only to the Pope of Rome. What do we see? We see appeals to the council, the Acts of the Apostles, of all the apostles getting together and speaking. And Peter is not the last one to speak, but actually James is, and he pronounces the decision of the all the apostles. And what do we see in the Acts? What do they say? They say Peter has spoken. No. They say it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. The living voice is of the Holy Spirit when the church is in council. Exactly why St. Eustine condemns so drastically the infallibility of the Pope is that it's a total overturning of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the body as the body with the head speaking in council, as was the case from the beginning, from the very Acts of the Apostles. But <clears throat> uh, so this idea that the Orthodox appeal to distant figures, he says. That might be closer to an Orthodox move, he says. Those are, are appeals to texts or to distant figures. I don't know where he gets this idea because we don't appeal to distant figures. We, have, we are following the Holy Fathers of our day. And they are following the Fathers before them and so on and so forth all the way through church history. That's the holy tradition, the living voice coming down to us. It's not, it's not reserved only in one place or one uh, local church or one bishop. It's actually in every local church that the Holy Spirit is speaking through the saints of every day. So we do follow the fathers. We do go and speak face to face with the eyewitnesses of the word today. Many saints in our day. We have many saints that have been produced in the 20th and 21st centuries. We have St. Paisios and St. Jacobos and St. Porfirios, and it goes on and on, and St. Justin and many, many others, and holy men and women who live today. But the idea that that would be reserved to only one man, and he alone is the authority of the entire global church, is, is exactly the, uh, the undoing of the true conciliar nature of the church, of that which we saw in the Acts of the Apostles. So, uh, it's tragedy that they have reserved this, which, which is in every local church among many. They've now put this into essentially an institution. And now a man sits on a chair, ex cathedra, they said. And when he does that, he's infallible. And he is going to govern the church from, the, from Rome alone. And we have to go to that person and only him for the entire church. But that's just not what we see in the, the first millennium or throughout the history of the church. And it's a tragedy that the Lord would, if, if, if that were possible, he would limit it only to that man, and he alone could judge everything. Uh, that's not how it works. Every local church, every place, there's a Eucharistic synaxis, uh, where one presides in Christ in love, and in the midst of them, two or three, Christ is in their midst. And he speaks to, the, to them in, in, when they're gathered together in his name, in the Eucharist, and in him and for him, and, and that's how they live out their life in Christ, and he's there. He says this. He didn't say in Rome only or only among the chief of the apostles, but in the Eucharist where he is, right? That's the Eucharistic synesis. So it's kind of a tragedy that he doesn't see uh, the, the limitations and the, uh, I mean, if you, if you were to consider the, uh, the affront of infallibility, according to St. Eustine, and maybe he would even see um, just how far. But as well, I said, again, I, I reverence a lot of Orthodox theology. Love it. Love uh, Orthodox theo theologians. So again, are they exercising certain gifts better than, than we? Yeah, probably. But we have all the gifts that Christ wants his people to have. So that's interesting. He has all the gifts that Christ, but at the same time, he's limiting the discernment and the, 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 the judgment to one man in one local church. So where are all the gifts exactly? We just, Orthodox physiology and Orthodox life shows us that in each local church, the abundance of the fruits of the Spirit is present and the discernment of the spirits is present. We would say the, the, the tragedy of Catholicism, as we've seen here tonight, is that they lost the discernment of the spirits and they embraced, for instance, in the example of Francis of Assisi, uh, uh, a spirituality and a... Uh, uh, an expression of uh, of love toward Christ and all the rest that he certainly had as a human being, but he did it in a way which was which was inconsistent with the whole holy tradition and ascetical life 
uh, coming before him. So just give one example. So um, he, he loves theologians. He loves Orthodox theology. Uh, and we can exercise gifts better than him. And yet, uh, this is a bit of a bizarre, bizarro land. Uh, it reminds me of, um, uh, of Vatican II and other documents that have come out since then that say, uh, of course, the Orthodox are a local church. Of course, the Orthodox are a church with the Eucharist. Uh, but they have Christ, of course, and uh, uh, grace and all the rest and the mysteries. But they're, they're lacking something. And what, what are they lacking? They're lacking the Pope, uh, which is bizarre to say the last, to say the least. Because if you have Christ, how could you be lacking anything? And how could there be something greater or beyond Christ? Uh, so anyway, that's one thing. Let's see now. Let's hear Scott Hahn and. So I'll say this: though. I wanted to go Orthodox. Hmm. I was drawn to the. Tell the us liturgy. why. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. don't you don't have the the Pope. The stumbling block of the Pope, at least. Yeah, I mean, I was ordained a pastor, and I could be ordained as a married man, a priest in the Orthodox Church, and so I wouldn't have to commit professional suicide like I would if I became a Catholic. And so what I did was I traveled around and I visited some Orthodox Christians, and I let, let me let me comment. I can't I can't not comment on that. He he's he's one of the most well known prolific writers, teachers in Catholicism in America. I don't think he committed suicide, professional suicide, if you would have gone to an Orthodox, uh, uh, you know, little tiny church somewhere, you know, Ukrainian, Russian, Romanian, more likely he would have had less influence. So it's, it's a little weird that he thought that was, uh, uh, you know, he made a big sacrifice by going to uh, Catholicism. I also visited a few Orthodox churches and I realized very early that, um, that Orthodoxy is ethnic. There's Greek. There's Ukrainian, there is Estonian, there's Serbian, there's Russian. And, you know, I, I always sort of, no, I didn't always. I had recently become suspicious of denominations, you know, and just the proliferation of denominations. And then when I realized there were more than a dozen autocephalous Orthodox bodies that are all defined by their ethnicity, I coined a term back then called denominationalism, hmm. that if there's one thing the new covenant isn't, that the old covenant was was ethnic and nationalistic. It was Israel first. So let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about that for a minute here. So he's he's uh, as as do many apologists and contemporaries who looked at orthodoxy and walked away. He's looking at the uh, the ethnic uh, character of orthodoxy, and he's uh, he's seeing this as inauthentic. And certainly, the if if there are uh, in the Orthodox Church those who are embracing a kind of Judaizing uh, mentality that one has to become uh, something they're not, some ethnic group uh, in order to become a Christian, then that is anathema. But that's anathema to the Orthodox Church. Instead of realizing that uh, the Church has always been local, and that each community took on a particular character, and then each local church. Put, Picked on, took on a, a particular character, and this was a strength and could be a great strength for the Orthodox Church because they enculturated deeply and redeemed and sanctified the culture. So if you would have gone back uh, 100 years ago to a very nationalistic Roman Catholic uh, country that has now become totally secularized in Europe, uh, something like you know Spain or Italy or anything, they would have looked a lot like and they would have been a lot like, culturally speaking, because he's looking at something superficial culturally, the Greek or the Russian or the Romanian. In fact, when they came over to America, they had ethnic, they had very ethnic uh, churches in North America. The only difference they had was a, a, a administrative imposed unity. But even the unions who came over, and many of them became Orthodox in the 20s, they had a very ethnic approach and they were part of the Roman Catholic communion. So this is a very short-sighted and superficial uh, critique that, that Dr. Hahn is, is engaging in here. He had a little more historical depth and background, and he looked at things, how they developed in North America. He would see them in context and would not, not be uh, scandalized by them. America is a very unique place in the history of the world. It takes people from all over the world, and they come, they come here with many of them intending to go back to the old country. But they come here and they try to hold on to their identity in a melting pot community. So he could easily have seen this as a great strength that the church was so powerful and is so powerful in the Orthodox places around the world that 
the they meld into and and the identity becomes it's incarnational it takes on the whole community the society the culture and it makes it all orthodox it makes it all christian and it becomes one and it's very hard to pull those apart afterwards and so for someone to become it, it's like it's like you're going to rip off the, the the flesh of somebody to reveal the the spirit but it's impossible you cannot easily separate greek from orthodox because it's been so embedded in the stones with the martyrs and the confessors for 2,000 years. And so when they come to America, of course, it's going to be a long process of implanting. They didn't come here as missionaries, Dr. Hahn. They came here as immigrants, as did many, many, many Roman Catholics. So this is an extremely superficial critique. And it's a tragedy that he didn't go deeper and see the faith. But he judged orthodoxy so superficially uh, to reject it on that basis. Uh, of course, it's a problem that the Orthodox themselves, as far as administrative unity, the Orthodox themselves admit that this is an Achilles heel. But it's the problem is not one of the core of the nature of the church. Uh, we have missionaries around the world. We have missionaries in America. We have many English speaking churches all over America. So when somebody says, well, I went to a local ethnic church, they could have easily gone down the street to an English speaking church and found orthodoxy in their language. So a little bit disappointed that the what renowned scholar uh, tripped up on such a superficial point. And it just struck me that when I went to a Greek Orthodox church, it was more Greek than I could be. And I felt like an outsider. And so the other thing too is the filioque. Uh, and we can't get into this, but it's one of my favorite discoveries yeah. uh, that if so you just 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 for people at home, the filioque was something inserted by the church after the Council of Nicaea. That's so right. The Orthodox are right on that, but your point is that the the Orthodox are wrong to deny that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's They're, right. I mean, yeah. in the seventh century and beyond, you have a semi-Arian heresy spreading in the West, mostly in Spain, that the Church in the West has to respond to, and so the Bishop of Rome does by inserting the filioque, so that the full divinity of the Holy Spirit is affirmed more explicitly. So he got it all wrong. I don't think he says he's very interested in this topic, but he got it all wrong. First of all, as we saw, the Bishop of Rome did not insert it until the, the 11th century, the beginning of the 11th century. It had been inserted in the West in places around Rome, but Rome resisted it and didn't want to bring it in and have it officially be a part and to confess it. In fact, they were with the Council of the Eighth Ecumenical Council, which we talked about earlier in this podcast. So he got that all wrong. And furthermore, they didn't put it in to show the divinity of the Holy Spirit, but the divinity of Christ. In Spain, when this initially uh, began, uh, the attempt there, as he initially said, I think maybe he just got confused, it was about the Arianism. And so they wanted, to, they thought this was a way to support the divinity of Christ. Uh, it was a terrible idea uh, because it was a departure from Trinitarian, Orthodox Trinitarian theology, and it was a, it was a walking away from the council uh, the councils and the, and the declaration of the councils to not change the confession of faith. Uh, so, uh, but it was not the Bishop of Rome who did that. And, and he did not do it until very late. And it was actually the Franks and not the Romans in Rome who ended up inserting the filioque in one, 1009, as we saw earlier in this podcast. So uh, he, he ought to go back and read the history. And so he can get it, he can get it right. But there's also more to it than that, because there was already tension between East and West, and so the East didn't accept that decision and began to controvert it over the course of the next few years. So he got this all wrong as well. The East didn't controvert the decision. The East tried to, the East, as we saw earlier in this podcast, didn't, was resisting along with Rome, the, the innovation, the addition, and the, the heretical teaching uh, didn't controvert a decision by Rome. Uh, uh, as if as if this was made earlier and then we reacted uh, after we accepted it or something. I don't know what he means, controvert. We, we uh, were in council with Rome, we condemned the addition, and then the Franks came and walked away from the council. So again, not a very good grasp on the history. In 1054, they have the mutual excommunications. And so more calmly and dispassionately, I went and looked at the filioque, kind of. 
You notice how he didn't mention 109 or 114 or Council of 879 or anything, right? It just all of a sudden we're 1054 and um, we're hurling anathemas for uh, a, a, um, an addition that had been there for, for centuries. A total misunderstanding of history. ...to find that the Orthodox were right. But, you know, by common consent, the only way we know the so-called eternal processions of the Son from the Father and the Holy Spirit from the Father mm -hmm. and through the Son or from the Father and the Son, the only way we know the eternal processions are through the temporal missions. So I don't know what, what the, Dr. Hahn's talking about right here. The only way we know the eternal processions are from, are from the temporal missions. This, this, he's confusing two different things entirely that that one does not tell us anything about the other. The created and the uncreated are totally unrelated here. The temporal missions uh, are the economy of salvation, the sending of the Holy Spirit by the Son on the day of Pentecost. But that's the sending. That's not the eternal procession. So you can't, you cannot derive. That's the whole point. You cannot derive from the temporal missions the eternal relationship of the Trinity. How do we know that? How do we know what we know about it? Christ told us in Scripture. This is the temple missions tell us if the Father uh, and the Son, uh, if the Spirit uh, proceeds from the Father. I mean, it's Christ who's, who said it right in Scripture. So all you have to do is go to Scripture and see that the Lord, the Lord himself said, who proceeds from the Father. That's what the, he said. He reveals the revelation's been given. And it's from him that we know. And only from him could we know the eternal reality and eternal procession. There's no way for us to know otherwise. The temporal missions aren't going to tell us anything about the eternal procession. So I, I'm not sure what he's talking about, and, and I'm not even sure he, he knows what uh, Roman Catholic theology is talking about in this, in this case. Nobody disputes that in the temporal missions, the Father sends the Son mm -hmm. to become man, and according to the farewell discourse in John 15 and 16, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. And so... If the missions reveal these eternal processions, and there's no way to know the processions Absolutely, apart man. from the missions, then you know if everybody is affirming that the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit, then how can the the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and not from the Son? So this is the classical problem of Latin theolo theologians confusing the theology, the eternal procession, with the economy, the um, the temporal, as he calls the temporal missions. And he says, again, there's no way to know the processions apart from the missions. Again, that's not the case. We don't know anything about the eternal processions of Christ did not reveal them. And he says, if the temporal missions reveal these eternal processions, they don't reveal the eternal processions at all. I don't know where he gets this or why he's, why he. So you see here now on two points, Dr. Hahn, one of the most renowned apologists for Catholicism in America, has, has made a mess of it. He, he's made a mess of the whole question of ethnicism in America. It's a very easy and understandable thing to sit down and understand why things are they are. It does not reflect uh, on the nature of the church, the theology of the church, the spiritual life of the church. It's basically an historical anomaly. America is an historical anomaly in many ways. And by the way, Catholicism had the same problem. Yes, they had an administration that was united, but they had many ethnic parishes and there were people up until recently and it still are in some places where they're Polish and the Polish go here and they don't go to the Italians down the street. Not a big difference from what is different is that the Orthodox hang on to their identity against the secular uh, melting pot in America. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Now, what's not a good thing, and the Orthodox need to correct it, is they need to become much more conscious of the mission to those around them and to reach out to the orthodox the non-orthodox around them and to give them and preach them and teach them and show them through their love of the gospel that definitely could be a critique that i would agree with dr Hahn if you made that on a personal level but that's not reflecting our ecclesiology our christology the truth of the of the, of the gospel our spiritual life uh the saints and all the rest uh it's uh it's, it's apples and oranges but anyway and then he I don't know what he's talking about in terms of the missions and the procession. So, uh, if that's how he ended up in Catholicism and he didn't, he didn't become a, an Orthodox. I don't. I my gut tells tells me that that's not the real reason why he went to Catholicism. There's much more to it, but those are the reasons he gives, and they're rather disappointing. So, <clears throat> with that, we're going to go to. Um, 
the last two slides and talk just about a conclusion if we can give it tonight, although we might come back and do more on this topic uh, going forward. Uh, so at this point, as has happened again and again through church history from the schism on, it's impossible to imagine at this point union between Orthodoxy and Catholicism without great repentance on the part of uh, the leaders of Catholicism. And uh, if we go back to church history, we see that we had failed attempts at union, false unions in Lyon and in Florence. Over time, with every new innovation and reformation, union increasingly becomes more impossible. After Trent and all the medieval changes, the innovations we talked about in terms of the mysteries, after the imposition of the unia, I haven't even talked about that tonight, another major issue is the creation in various parts in the East of uh, and the breaking away of certain Orthodox who joined Rome, and then they created this, what we call the unions in the Orthodox Church, those who united with the Pope, but kept the Orthodox trappings and liturgy and all the rest. Uh, and this was an attempt to basically steal sheep. It was an attempt to, uh, you know, uh, very antagonistic and proselytism during the 17th, 18th century in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so the union was another sign of. Uh, uh, of a grave uh, chasm and division in terms of the ethos and in terms of the outlook and all the rest. Vatican I and the infallibility is a major obstacle, of course, Vatican II and a new ecclesiology and the Reformation. Basically, we have a Protestant Reformation of Catholicism in Vatican II. And now what we're facing is more or less another attempt at a false union between secularized ecumenist leaders in both Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And of course, it's going to fail as it, as it already has. It'll be the third failure because it's not based on the truth and the, and the true repentance and true uh, union in Christ. Uh, the errors and innovations are many. We didn't touch on several of them tonight. We only touched on a few. We have, of course, the filioque, which we could talk about at length, papal primacy, universal primacy. We have the dissolution of the mysteries, especially of baptism and the unity of the mysteries. We have a new spirituality that's that's arisen since Vatican II, especially that is, and we saw it also going all the way back to Francis of Assisi. We have liturgical innovations and dissolution of the liturgical rites in many places, especially after Vatican II. We have the idea of created grace. We have the idea of original sin, which is distorted and not patristic in its entirety. We have Immaculate Conception, which flows from that understanding, which is, a, which is an error. We have the papal infallibility, which is the uh, now the St. Eustin calls the heresy of heresies. Uh, again, Vatican II ecclesiology. And what we didn't mention is a, a rise in the last 40 years of charismatic Pentecostal spirituality within Catholicism. Nobody talks about that. It's one of the most, uh, problematic in many ways signs of Catholicism going the way of Protestantism and of delusion because the charismatic Pentecostal movements uh, from an Orthodox perspective are filled with delusion and demonic delusion and lots of problems uh, from a patristic standpoint. So that's a short summary, but we could go on and talk about many more uh, aspects. We didn't even talk about uh, the question of uh, transubstantiation. We didn't talk about the uh, uh, unleavened bread. There's many things that uh, could be added to, to, to our list here. Now, a little bit of recommended reading. Take a screenshot, if you want, of this page and save it. And if you're interested in, this, in these topics, you can go deeper. There's many more texts than, the, than these, obviously. Just a few off the top of my head here. Uh, but some that you might want to be interested, you might want to acquire in the near future. One would be the Treatise on the Procession of the Holy Spirit by St. Gregory Palamas, which is forthcoming from Lincoln Mountain Press. Uh, of course, Aristotle, East and West by David Bradshaw, very important on the question of the noose and of the, the, the understanding of divine energies and, and other topics. Very, very important uh, patristic theology that he's presenting there. And uh, uh, Christian East and Rise of the Papacy, which we mentioned in the talk on the papacy by a former uh, scholar and uh, uh, from France in the 19th century became Orthodox and wrote on the papacy. Father John Romanides has tremendous insight into the historical and theological developments around the schism and his book, which I think you can find online, Frank's Romans, Feudalism and Doctrine, 
very uh, important to understand the historical and theological uh, events around the schism. The Church and the Pope, which we mentioned in the talk uh, by Robert Spencer, coming up from our press. Church and Ecumenism by St. Eustine Pope, which we quoted. The Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit by St. Photios the Great, one of the most important documents to understand the orthodox theology of the Trinity and why the filial Greek is heretical. And that's a, a, a text that was uh, written just after the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Two Paths, a very good book by a layman, uh, Orthodoxy and Catholicism, Rome's Claims of Papal Supremacy in the Light of Orthodox Christian Teaching. Uh, a very interesting text, My Exodus for Roman Catholicism by Bishop Paul. He was a uh, monk in Spain and he ended up becoming an Orthodox Bishop in, uh, in Mexico. And he writes about his uh, uh, becoming Orthodox back in the, I think, 50s or 60s. Uh, Ancestral Sin by Father John Romanides, a very important text. Uh, uh, showing the patristic teaching, and I Confess One Baptism by Father George Metellinos, among many others. So with that, we'll close it out. We'll open it up to questions, and I appreciate uh, very much uh, your uh, your patience. So let's see, John, what do we got for questions tonight? All right, from Paul Peter. Paul Peter, I have Roman Catholic friends Mention Western saints like Padre Pio, Therese de Lisieux, I don't know how to say that, Rita, etc. And how many miracles occurred with them, like blood from Eucharist? And what, what do I say and what do I make of it? Um, let's see. Am I missing something here? Yeah, I don't know. If there's something else there, I don't know what else I'm supposed to be, uh, what else the question is. What do you make of it? Well, why do you have to make any of it? Uh, I, don't, I don't understand. Why, why is that something you need to answer? Um, we are not impressed by miracles. Miracles are done by the demons. Um, in and of themselves, they mean nothing. They have to be in the context of the truth uh, and of course uh, lead to the spirit and the love and the life in Christ. So uh, I, I think the Lord made it clear that the uh, angel of, or St. Paul said the angel of uh, can, uh, a light can come down and uh, preach another gospel. So these things are, are, not, are neither here nor there. They're not really important. Miracles are not really that important in the, the day. And if we, we rely on them and we look to them and we try to figure out the truth of things through miracles, um, I think that we're in danger. Uh, so um, I don't I don't know anything about those. I don't need to pronounce on them here, they're neither here nor there. But if they're not in the context of the church and bringing people to life in Christ and all the rest, then I don't see why they uh, they should be of interest for an Orthodox Christian. I think it's just you know neither here nor there. There's tons of things that the demons can do. There's all kinds of quote unquote miracles that are worked among witches and uh, in Africa. If you read the life of uh, Father Cosmas of Gregorio, you can um, uh, see all kinds of insane, insane miracles worked between the various uh, 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 demonically led uh, magicians. Uh, there's a witchcraft and magic going on in Africa all the time. So in and of itself, a, uh, an, a miraculous event says nothing. In fact, we should be on guard. Uh, you know, uh, the basic teaching of the fathers is uh, uh, to reject uh, visions, to reject dreams, uh, not to believe in them, not to accept them, not to look for them. Right? We don't need that. We have the we have the relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't need any of that. None of that is going to uh, make uh, make us more holy, uh, bring us closer to Christ, uh, make us more illumined. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a trap, I think, in our day. With the, the Antichrist will work all kinds of miracles at the end of the world. Uh, if people look to those for illumination, they're going to be, they're going to be sadly mistaken. Uh, Francisco Cabana, Father, what advice would you give to Catholics who want to convert to the Orthodox Church but live in Catholic countries? There are no churches near me. What should I do? Thank you, Francisco. Uh, appreciate that. So it's a practical question. Francisco, it's a practical question. You may have to, you may have to uh, travel to be received into the church. You may have to do catechism online. Uh, you might have to work with somebody like me or anybody else who's out there teaching. Use our our resources 
uh, approach somebody who you know, uh, a priest that you trust, and, and begin a process of catechism. If there's no other way, you have no churches next to you, and you've got to take that that is the next next big thing. And then you're going to have to get in the plane or car or whatever it is and work out a way to go spend a week or two or three at a parish uh, around Pascha and, and be initiated into the church. Uh, or you're going to have to move. You're going to have to move to closer to an Orthodox church. These are practical questions. These aren't theological questions. These aren't spiritual questions. These are practical questions that you need to solve. And you may, you may have a tremendous uh, cross and a struggle, but it will be rewarded richly by the grace of God. Uh, the Lord will send great grace to one who sacrifices out of love and desire to be united to him. And you may be one of the first in your area to become Orthodox and God will send more and who knows, but travel and walk by faith uh, to embrace that, uh, uh, to embrace Christ wherever you can find him. You can write me if you want and I can try to point you to someone near you, uh, try to help you as much as I can. Next question, does the head completely have to be immersed? I've seen many baptisms here in Australia with only the body being immersed for baby baptisms and also being in the baptism up to the ankles and receive the rest of the water by pouring, I think probably to avoid drowning. Well, I can't comment on every single baptism that's taken place and whether God's grace worked. I can just tell you what the fathers teach. I can tell you what the fathers teach and what the fathers do that I know, contemporary saints like Elder Ephraim and others, they baptized every single human being, fully immersed them. That's what the Lord teaches us. That's what we do as we've done for 2,000 years. There's no danger if one is spiritually prayerful and has a fear of God. And they, they, it's very easy to learn how to baptize. It's not, a, not something we need to fear. If we have fear, we have a problem. If we're a priest that has fear, we've got to work on that. Uh, this is a initiation into heaven. Uh, there's no reason why there should be anything bad to the child, God forbid. Uh, the fact that we've been thinking on that level is problematic. There's no threat, especially if the child is baptized um, in uh, at a young age. I mean, the, if the older they get, um, they actually think it makes things more practically difficult. And that's not the practice of the tradition of the church is to wait and wait and wait. So as far as uh, them uh, uh, having their ankle in water and then pouring on top, that's not an orthodox practice. That's not blessed. I don't know why they're doing that. Uh, they should immerse the child. And, uh, you know, if there's some, here's what, uh, here's what I understand. If there's some weakness and it's not a systematic distortion and par uh, 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 departing, but some weakness on the part of the priest uh, and it's not intentional, then we don't need to worry about the grace of God fills up. We have prayer in the prayer for ordination. Uh, we believe the Spirit of God will complete and fill up that which is lacking. Uh, God forbid. I mean, we're 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 uh, weak human beings. However, if there's a systematic uh, turning away from the patristic teaching and ignorance, indifference, and we look at the other bad examples around us of non-Orthodox who are baptizing with just a little bit of water here and there, and we think that's perfectly fine, then I don't see on what basis we can hope that the Lord will make make up for it because he respects our freedom. He respects us when we apostatize. He said, you, you know, follow after me. He didn't, he didn't chase after them when he didn't follow after him. He said, he let them go. If we turn away from the teachings, the Kerivia, the, the examples of the saints, that's we've chosen the consequences. So if it's a systematic turning away and an, in, an indifference to the teaching of the church and examples of the saints, then there needs to be repentance. There needs to be repentance on the part of the priest, the people, and all the rest. Um, and I don't know what God will do. Uh, I, I think we should have the fear of God and, and, and do whatever we can to avoid bad consequences. I was Another question. I was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, and I was chrismated into Orthodoxy about four months ago. Is baptism still necessary for me? Well, I will tell you what the Ecclesia of the church is. I'll tell you what the saints teach, and I'll tell you what some of the saints in our day have done. And you have to go and decide, and you have to get together with your spiritual father, your bishop, your priest, whatever it is. But the reality is that we have a general turning away from the patristic teaching in our day, which has set presuppositions for economy, presuppositions for departure from the strictness, from the Kredivia. Those presuppositions exist 
And they're in the patristic teachings, they're in the Padalian, the collection of, of, of canons, they're in the saints, like Saint Paiso Tadushkovsky or Saint Hilarion Trotsky or many of the elders of Mount Athos. They, they follow strictly the pre, that their presuppositions exist. And what are the presuppositions for economy? First of all, there has to be a need. There has to be a need. There is no mystery outside the church. The church is the mystery. There's only one mystery. It's the economy of Christ. All the other mysteries are an expression of that one mystery of the incarnation. So there's no mystery somewhere else outside of Christ, afar from Christ, that initiate people into Christ. All right. So if you come to the Orthodox Church and you are coming from 99% of the heterodox today, do not baptize. That's a presupposition for economy, that they actually immerse. When I say baptize, I don't mean the mystery with the Holy Spirit present. I mean the external form. They're not keeping the form anymore. They're walking away from it systematically, consciously. That's what I commemorated in tonight's talk. Tonight's talk talked about how they systematically said, no more immersion. We're going to put it over the water, over the head. And that's the norm in Catholicism and has been for a long, long time. So that's a conscious decision not to do what the apostles and the fathers taught. Therefore, when they walk away from the form, we no longer economize. We no longer say it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, uh, you know, we no longer say it's OK to receive them by chrismation. We say they have to be baptized. They have to they have to receive the immersion. They have to receive the baptism. That's what baptism means. And so. The patristic teaching is that people coming to the Orthodox Church today need to be baptized. They should not be chrismated from coming from Catholicism or Protestantism. That's what St. Nicodemus and St. Paisios and the saints that the church listened to and codified in their canonical literature 250 years ago. That's the authority. It's not St. So-and-so in the 5th century, the 10th century, the 12th century, whatever it is. It's not some decision that they made in uh, a council in the 15th century. It's what came down to us in the Book of Canons and the interpretation from the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the saints who have poured over this and said, this is what the Patricia teaching is. It doesn't matter what theologians tell you today. It's what the saints say. We follow the Holy Fathers and the saints. We don't follow Professor so-and-so and Dr. So-and-so. That's not authority in the church. So we go back and we see that we need to come into the church by baptism only when the presuppositions are there and only when there's a need there's some grave need do we depart do, do we depart from the acrivia the exactitude of the church's teaching and the fact today is we have a tremendous departure among many orthodox into an ecumenistic idea about the boundaries of the church and the mysteries of the church outside of orthodoxy that's not the patristic teaching that's not the patristic criteria that's not what's come down to us from the saints. Yes, there's, there's confusion. Yes, there's saints who say things that are different. But the saints that have spoken and been embraced by the church in synod and canons have been interpreted by them, they give us the rule. And the saints of our day, like St. Paisios of the Holy Mountain, who baptized uh, not only uh, uh Papal Protestants and Reformed Protestants, but Monophysites he baptized, as did Elder Isaac, who was his disciple, or St. Yaakovos of Evia, great saint, who baptized Papal Protestants who came to him. They didn't say there was economy. There was no need for economy, and there was no presupposition for economy. That's what I can tell you. Now, this error that they've committed, according to the saints, is an error. It doesn't, it's not, should not have been done. The, the presuppositions were not there. The economy was not wise and according to the Holy Fathers and according to according to the teachings of the saints. So at this point, priests and bishops need to figure out what they're going to do. Are they going to stop this practice and get, come back to the Holy Fathers and start doing what the saints have done and do? Or are they going to they're going to they're going to throw off their ecumenist mindset and they're going to properly see what the saints do and what the presuppositions are. St. Paisi Vesikos, one of the greatest saints in the last 300 years, the fount of renewal in Romania and Russia, the, the man behind the Philokalia, he baptized everyone and even the unions who baptized properly. He could have done economy and he refused to. St. Paisi Vesikos, how many examples do you want? That's the kind of thing we need. We're in the middle of grave heresy. We're in the middle of departures left and right. 
economy is not called for even when there is the presuppositions it's not called for today because there's a grave heresy that's distorting and reinterpreting the boundaries of the church so i've given you a very extensive answer it's more uh to beyond your question but i think you know that's what i can tell you i can't tell you every particular case what you're going to do now with that information you're going to have to go and pray and find somebody to guide you according to the patristic teaching uh, if one were to believe that a clerical role could grant the dogmatic infallibility, does this not fundamentally change one's entire view of human anthropology itself? Thank you very much, Paisius, for the question. I have always wondered, how in the world can one believe that the chair can sanctify in and of itself? Why is that the truth? We have many heretical bishops. Why is it that when he sits on the chair, and he pronounces he's infallible. When we had many, including popes of Rome, in the past on dogmatic issues who were anathematized and rejected by synods, ecumenical synods, or at least two, and they didn't get it right. They were teaching dogmatic issues, and they got it wrong, and they were they were they were anathematized. They were excommunicated. So why do we think this is almost magical? It's it's almost magical, right? That this and it's and it it's totally not consistent with our understanding of holiness. Holiness comes about through ascetic struggle. Holiness comes about through purification. Enlightenment comes through great, great ascetic struggle and, and purification and enlightenment through the Holy Spirit in the mysteries over a long period of time. It doesn't come because a, a chubby old man sits on the seat and says, I am now infallible because I'm going to teach you the dogmas of the faith. I mean, it's, it is truly a great, a grave and 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 terrible departure from basic uh, uh, understanding of the spiritual life and 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 in, in anthropology as well, but but soteriology and how how we're saved and how one is illumined. I mean, it doesn't work that way. We have, you know, why why can't he be a heretic, claim to teach ex cathedra, and 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 deliver uh, heretical teachings? There's nothing that would prevent that. If, if he chooses his if he uses his freedom, departs from the orthodox teaching, you know, with a small among a thousand, maybe, what? Why would people think he's going to be protected? It's as if he's not free. He's not free to, to teach heresy. Of course he is, and he, he can sit on the throne and he can they can be somebody like that. Why? Why would that be automatically protected? As if he's not he's that's he's got to participate. And of course, moreover, it's got to be the whole church. And Christ as the head, not just him. That's just uh, unbelievable. It's unbelievable people have arrived at that kind of teaching and, and thought this was the ancient teaching. I mean, they, they have to make the case this is with the teaching in the first century, the third century, that this was the teaching. It doesn't even, it's not even consistent with our understanding of the spiritual life, let alone 2,000 years of church tradition. Another question. In the American church, we have the miraculous icon, Our Lady of Sitka. However, if I recall, the last time I've seen it, it depicts God the Father. How can this be? Uh, you'll have to excuse me on this question. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know much about the uh, uh, the icon, and uh, and so I'm not going to be able to answer that. Um, do souls go directly to hell or heaven when they die, or is this a holding place like how Catholics believe? If not, why do we still pray for the souls of the dead? We don't have a holding place. We don't have purgatory in the Orthodox Church. It's not a patristic teaching. Uh, there is the uh, teaching coming from a long uh, uh, experience of the many of the saints and the ascetics, uh, which talks about the departure of the soul from the body and the ascent to the judgment seat of Christ and the demonic powers uh, which are coming to tempt and take away that soul uh, if it had given, let's say, rights to the enemy. Right? If you lived for the passions, you lived and you did the will of the enemy, and you turned away from uh, the Lord, uh, then you've given rights, so to speak, to the enemy and the demons and the devil. And so when your soul departs from the body and ascends to heaven, uh, there's going to be grave temptation and, and uh, attempts to, uh, for attempts of the demons to take you and say, this soul belongs to us. Why? Because you have loved what they are and they have done. Right. So now they say, well, this comes here and the just judge will judge whether that's the case. But you'll have the temptations with the demons 
as you uh, go to the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and uh, the, the judgment of God will be meted out. Uh, so we don't have anything like purgatory. We pray for the, we pray for the souls of those who departed because we love them. And God in his love has no bounds. And, the, and all of his boundaries and all of his commandments are under him, not over him. He's not beholden to them. He and his economy is the only law at the end of the day. And his love is the, 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 the last uh, hope for every human being. So we cry out to his, for, for him to show his love. We cry out on behalf of our brothers and sisters because we love them. And we pray and we know from experience throughout church history that those prayers are heard and people are, uh, are benefited and comforted and they're brought closer to the light if they're in the darkness by God's love. It overcomes even that. Now he, the one who's departed, having separated from the, soul, the body, the teaching of the fathers is that he cannot repent. There is no repentance. In other words, change on his own. There's no, there's no reorientation on his own because he's no longer a fully a human being. He's got he's this division of his soul and body. So, so we pray on his behalf because he can't repent and change and, and make progress. But our prayers, God's love, our love, it can uh, move mountains according to the teaching of the Lord. So anyway, that's a short, short answer for a very much longer uh, topic. Uh, another question. Thank you for the super chat. What is the point of synods in the Catholic Church if the Pope is infallible? And what would be the point of the Catholics accepting any council? Um, I don't know. I, I I don't know how they reconcile that. There's You can go to Vatican II and you can see how they try to reconcile all that. Obviously, they they believe that. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know why. Why would they be? Why couldn't he just pronounce this is the doctrine of the church? Um, ultimately, he, he can. My understanding is he can without reference to the council, and so it does seem to make him basically independent and superior on those dogmatic issues. Uh, perhaps the council does everything else, but then at the end of the day, they bring it to him and he, he gives a stamp of blue. I don't know. I know that's a good question, and maybe maybe we can uh, address that in a future talk. But I'm not not that I'm not that interested to go that much deeper uh, because it's so problematic as it is. Um, so I don't know what they how they reconcile the council for them in this case. Has the church fallen if a bishop is professing mortal sins like adultery or murder or theft? If not, can we excuse the pope from past sins? Um, has the church fallen? Well, that's kind of a strange question. Uh, personal sin is the responsible party is the person. The church is Christ. The church is Christ and all the members of Christ. When we commit mortal sins, when we preach heresy, we depart spiritually immediately from the spirit. We lose the spirit of God. We walk away from it. We no longer have communion. We turn away from Christ and we turn away from his commandments and we lose communion with the grace of God. He doesn't stay where there's lies and, and, and filthiness, right? So personally, we, we, we're, we're, we're on the path of perdition. The church is not affected by our personal falls, right? The church is Christ and all those who are gathered in him and remain faithful to him. So, um, and then the question of, if not, can we excuse the Pope from past sins? I, I don't know. That's up to the Pope and his bishops. I really don't know what we can do. Scott Hahn talks about another question from Joshua. Scott Hahn talks about the river in Revelation 22, 1 to 7, including the Filioque. Can you please give the Orthodox view on this passage? I don't know. I, I can't do that right now. I'll be happy to mark it and see, but like off the top of my head right now, I'm not going to do that, but maybe in the future. So thank you for that. Maybe we can copy paste and look at that. It sounds like an interesting adventure. Let me actually. Uh, Put that down here so I remember it. Yeah. Uh, next question. What is wrong with unleavened bread for the Eucharist? What is it? Why is it a big deal? For example, the Orthodox Western Rite, I think, use unleavened bread. Uh, I didn't get into that tonight. Uh, I didn't get into that because it's not a. It's a, it's a major topic at the time. Uh, again, indicative of a stance which is a departure from the tradition of the holy church which is always leavened bread and uh christ is the leaven 
uh, and has been used from the ancient times. Uh, it was not unleavened bread uh, as mistaken by the Latins. So uh, we can get into that if you'd like. I don't have an answer right now, but uh, I can take that down as well and we can look at it. But um, it was a debate that was pretty heated at the time, but I think more in terms of indicative of their departure from Holy Tradition, just like they were fasting on Saturdays, which also was offensive in the East, because again, it was a departure from ancient apostolic tradition that on Saturday and Sunday, we don't fast from oil. Uh, and so, you know, in and of itself, you might say, well, what's the big deal? But it's indicative of a stance, which is a depart which is departing from holy tradition. And I think that's the main value there. And then, you know, when you depart in small things, eventually you depart in large things. And that's exactly what happened. So in the spiritual life, the struggle is to keep the, the lesser things, the, the things that uh, uh, the, not allow the devil to creep in in the small things. And if you do that, then you're going to be you're going to be protected in the great things as well. So that's part of the answer. Uh, since orthodoxy dilutes laws, example, Catholicism has anathema, anathemas lifted and not heresy now, apparently. Trench is asking, since orthodoxy dilutes laws, when was the Orthodox Church at its peak in avoiding compromise? A hundred years ago, a thousand years ago? I don't know what this, I don't understand your question, Trench. It's a little more specific, uh, uh, it's it's a it, church history is filled with ups and downs. Church history is filled with apostates, heretics, patriarchs who are heretics, popes who are heretics. It's up and down. It's a it's it's a, it's a travel. We're traveling as pilgrims through a foreign land, a, a, an antagonistic place, uh, and of course we're going to have all kinds of falls and we're going to have all kinds of struggles. But as my as one elder in Mount Athos told me, if there's one person, say Mark of Ephesus. St. Athanasius, St. Maximus. There's one person who stands and confesses that's all God needs to recover and bring things uh, back to, to orthodoxy. So I wouldn't get caught up in numbers. Uh, we're in the day of tremendous apostasy all around the world. We're in the day of more heresy than ever. It's all these ancient heresies coming back with a vengeance, Gnosticism everywhere. So this is not surprising that today we're struggling, that we heretical bishops and theologians who are teaching heresy. It's not surprising. I think if you understand the context, you're going to say, of course. Uh, the struggle is among the faithful. Now we have the second problem, which is a, from the below, we have the secularization, the worldliness, the 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 uh, being sucked into the culture. That's what's problematic. I mean, they're both very problematic, but that's why we don't have the strong rejection uh, of heresy uh, in terms of theologians and bishops, because the people have become uh, deluded in their spiritual strength and struggle. And so it's a multifaceted struggle today to remain faithful to orthodoxy. Uh, you know, there's not, there's many peaks in church history. You have, when you have great saints like St. Gregory Palamas, you're at the peak uh, in terms of uh, confessing faith and, stri and stri struggling against heresy. Uh, Mad Seaborg, uh, what do you think of the argument made by modern Orthodox that only the seven ecumenical councils must be followed? Only the seven ecumenical councils must be followed. Who says that? I don't know anybody who says that. And if they're saying it, they, it doesn't make any sense because we, we just literally, uh, again and again, for the last 500 years, we've embraced both typically, but more essentially, the essence of the teachings of, this, of the eighth and ninth ecumenical council. And the eighth is unbelievably witnessed to as ecumenical by many bishops and many uh, encyclicals. So I don't know what they're talking about, you know, um, in terms of only seven. So what are they going to do with eighth? What are they going to do? They're going to throw it out as not ecumenical when everybody embraced it, including Rome for 200 years. Why? Why would they? Why would they not consider it ecumenical? And how about Secretary Paul Mas? He was embraced. And it was celebrating. We put a we put a Sunday after the after the um, Sunday of Orthodoxy during the Great Lent. The Church hasn't embraced his teachings. Of course, it has. Why why is this an issue? It's strange to me. Uh, Thecla, I have heard a few Greek Orthodox priests that say Catholicism and Orthodoxy have the same canons. How do I re respond to that? Have the same canons? What 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 does that mean? So they re they they have the same canons in ancient Church, but. Catholicism has added hundreds of new canons. They put new canons out all the time. What does that matter? And and 
living and following the canons in and of itself, I mean, they have to be applied and they have to be accepted, they have to be lived. So why is that a, why is that important they have the same canons? And they don't actually. I mean, they have, there's a portion that they all recognize together. There's all kinds of other canons that they, they don't recognize. So how do I respond to that? Uh, I know that this is not even true, but I don't want the conversation to end up in an argument. Well, I just, I think I gave you a good response, uh, but there's many more that they don't recognize. Uh, that they have, but we don't recognize. And you, the canon of itself, recognizing it is nothing. You have to live it and apply it, right? It has to be uh, given by a discerning spiritual father. Unless you're talking, I don't know what he's talking about, administrative canons. Or Do the heterodox have Christ in any sense, or are they on the same level as pagans coming from evangelicalism? I would like to think that they had always worshipped Christ and he heard me. Of course, the Lord hears you. You call out to Christ. He always hears you. He's running to save you. The difference is the following. The spirit of God, the divine energies in the church and outside the church are not the same always. All throughout creation, you have the divine energies of, of providence and, and the cre creative energies of God. Uh, and that's for every human being uh, that the, the Lord is, uh, as it were, uh, seeking to bring them all to himself. And so everyone who seeks and asks and knocks, he's going to help and assist to come to himself. Uh, so anybody who came to the church, anybody who's been inspired and loving the church is inspired and loved, loving the church by the grace of God. What's the difference? The difference is in the church and only in the church, because there are presuppositions to this and there's our freedom and we have to embrace it. The divine energies of purification, illumination, deification, the divine energies which accompany the mysteries are only in the church. The divine energy is the grace of God. That not The grace is not just one simple, uh, uh, it, is, it is a simple grace, but it, it has many different operations. And so the grace of God cannot work for purification, illumination, deification among those who are not initiated, who have not embraced the faith, who have not humbled themselves and freely uh, uh, come to Christ and submitted themselves to Christ. So that's the difference. But if you're evangelical and you're praying to God, uh, you can follow Christ. Uh, you, you, can, you can learn much from Christ. You can embrace Christ. You can't put him on in baptism. You can follow him. You cannot put him on in baptism. That happens in a, in a particular time and place. And that's where Christ's mysteries are offered. And that's where Christ's life is led within the body. That's the scandal of the incarnation to the rationalist. He can't handle that. He wants a, a nebulous, invisible uh, God that just is basically impersonal. That's why Buddhism is, you know, appealing to a lot of people because there's not, there's not a lot of there, you know. Whereas we say, no, you got to crucify your intellect. you got to say, I, you have the words of life, Lord. I don't understand, but I follow and I submit and I accept the cross and the resurrection. In the baptism, the chrismation, in the Eucharist, all of this. Another question from Trench, the Patriarch of Constantinople at the start of Greek independence war put an anathema on Greeks for revolting. Has it been lifted? Did this anathema weaken the church to bring in masonry? Patriarch Athanagoras said that God left the Orthodox Church as an example. What does that mean? Patriarch Athanagoras said that God left the Orthodox Church. Left, in other words, departed, or what does it mean? Left it in the world? I'm not quite sure. Uh, Petro Gathanagoras was a Mason himself, and he was a, a supreme ecumenist, so I wouldn't bank too much on what he has to say. Uh, Patriarch of Constantinople at the time was a saint, St. Gregory V. He was a martyr. He was killed by the Turks for uh, uh, his stance. Uh, if he, you now there's different, there's different narratives or different opinions on what exactly happened. All right, there's two groups basically. Let's say it's two groups. Saint Gregory the Fifth, who was the patriarch at the time, a great saint who worked with the Holy Bodies Fathers, and he was a he was a it was a very pious uh, saint who was lived on Manathos and all the rest. And he uh, did anathema. He sent an anathema for that. But the question is, some say he did that to save them and try to save them from being slaughtered by the Turks, because they were threatening to slaughter. They say. If he didn't anathematize it, others say no. He did anathematize, and he did it because these people, at least some of them, were Masons, and they were not acting in the best interest of the, of the church, uh, and they were they were really not uh, initially um, 
working with the church or listening to the church. Uh, and they were anesthetized because of their disobedience. And basically, they're going to bring about the loss of a lot of human life. So there's two different answers to that. I don't know the historical truth. But I would say that there was a lot of skepticism on the part of the more advanced spiritual minded in the church at the time because there were uh, people coming from Europe in the Philikia Theria, it's called in Greek, the, the Friends Society, who were, in the name of the revolution of Greece, bringing in, uh, you know, basically revolutionary ideas from France and other places and seeking to uh, initiate a revolution against the Ottomans, not for the sake of the Greeks, but for the sake of taking power over the new Greek country and incorporating them into a, a, a new uh, you know, basically Masonic Europe that was forming. It's a lot of speculation. I don't know. I don't know what the truth is. Um, uh, but uh, he's a saint, and I think he was a martyr for the truth. But I don't know which version in terms of the anathema. Uh, I, I tend to think that he actually did anathematize some people intentionally. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Super Chat Y2K something five dollars thank you for the stream father years you're welcome god bless you and thank you for the support always appreciate the support so so we can keep doing it another question was the pope considered a first among equals before they were excommunicated yes he would have been something like that yes he had the primacy of honor he had the the role of, he was looked to uh you know one of the reasons he was looked to was not just because it was the center of the empire at the time initially but because of the witness that the church gave in the ancient church, the witness that the church gave orthodoxy, a lot of the theological and political, you know, machinations were going on in the East. Uh, and so the church in the West didn't have a lot of intellectually minded, you know, philosoph philosophically minded uh, speculative theologians. They didn't come around ever so often and try to create schisms and, 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 and new ideas. Uh, you know, it was intellectually kind of, I mean, I hate to put it, but it was kind of backwater in the empire, right? It was in Latin. The Greek Greek was the main language by the end of the century. Uh, and that's when all the theology was done in Greek. So the, La the Latin Roman, I mean, there were Romans, Latin speaking Romans, eventually, they were Greek speaking for a long time, but then they were Latin speaking Romans. They were Romans. They were committed to the Roman Empire, the Roman emperor. They were committed to the Roman faith, which is orthodoxy. But over time, um, they became basically isolated. And then the Franks became very powerful. And eventually they unfortunately were extinguished by uh, heretical minded people in the West. And they lost, they lost the vitality. But for a long time, because of the vitality of the church and the staunch orthodoxy, they, they, didn't, they weren't tempted by all these various movements, uh, intellectual movements. They, their witness is what, why people would go there like St. Maximus or St. Athanasius and take refuge there from basically the political machinations of the heretics, right? If you look at church history, that's what's going on in a lot of cases. Uh, let's see. Was, uh, okay, also, is it wrong to call the Patriarch of Constantinople ecumenical in regards to what St. Gregory said? So, uh, I think the inter what's, what's important from St. Gregory, as we saw in the video, in the presentation, is he's rejecting the idea of one bishop over all the other bishops. So if that term carries that meaning, it needs to be rejected. If that term really means what they said it meant, no, he's not over all the bishops. And I don't think he even imagined that because that would have been rejected by the vast majority of bishops at the time as ridiculous. But uh, it was that he was the bishop of the empire, in other words, the seat of the empire. And so that's that's what the term meant. And so terms mean different things, right? But if it carries the meaning of over and a supreme ruler, then yes, then it needs to be rejected. Uh, I, I would be happy if it got it was dropped a long time ago because I think it's misleading, uh, and people are misled uh, and and think he's the present patriarch is overall the orthodox. And I think that's sometimes it seems like it's intentional. They want you to believe that that's the case. It's of course not the case. All right, Gary has a question. My godfather left orthodoxy for Byzantine Catholicism. Is he still my godfather? No, he's an apostate. He's an apostate, Gary. You, godfather has one role, to carry you 
up into heaven, right? To help you stay faithful. He apostatized, you need a new godfather. We're not sentimental here. Not, my godfather, my godfather. No, you apostatized, you walked away from orthodoxy. You're not leading me on the narrow path anymore. You're not leading me on the royal path. You have fallen off that path. And I, I'm not going to follow you down the road to perdition because you departed from the unity of the church and submission to Christ in the church. So unfortunately, he's not your godfather. You should pray for him and pray that he comes back, pray that he repents. Absolutely. We should show him love with discernment. Uh, you should not go to his church. You should not go pray with him. Uh, if you want to help him, he needs to come to his senses and come back to the one church. So that's a tragedy that he he was a godfather, but he walked away. He, what a terrible example he gave. What a terrible, tragic example he gave. I'm sorry for that, and I'm sorry for him. Hope he repents before it's too late. Uh, how would you respond to someone asking when the schism happened? If we claim the papers to be graceless and they don't make the same claim towards us, when do we claim they lost grace? We don't have to, Pisces, we don't have to have a particular date. We don't have to have that. It's not so important. But we know the historical events. As I said, 1009, 1009, they're removed from the diptychs. Are they graceless at that point? Probably not, right? Because we have the same thing going on today. Nobody's claiming that Russia or Constantinople is graceless. God forbid, immediately. No, it, it's, it's mendable for the time being. Now, is, um, there needs to be a, ultimately a ecumenical council that solves, decides things. That's the prayer. That's what we should work for, whether it be ecumenism or this schism uh, and the, the, what happened in Ukraine. But um, so we don't we can't make pronouncements. I can't make a pronouncement. Grace left then. Who, who am I to make that pronouncement? The church will make a pronouncement if it deems it necessary. But um, so we have 1009. We have 1014. So we have two. After five years, we have a reaffirm, reaffirmation of the filioque way. They're saying at that point, no, we're committed to the her heresy. We're committed to rejecting the council. We're committed to breaking off from the rest of you. Right? That's what they're saying with those with those decisions, the leaders at least. So there's probably people there fighting against that, right? There's Orthodox, Romans fighting against the Franks and all the rest that are trying to introduce this because it was definitely a Frankish mentality and, and, and stance. And... So by 1054, then they've got a very, very, you know, polemical stance, and now they're doubling, tripling down. At this point, the fruit starts to show within a couple of decades. You've got the dissolution. You heard what Congar said, amazing witness to me, that the grace of God is, 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 is departing. You know? But when exactly? I don't Nobody knows exactly. We don't need to know. Uh, another question. Although I'm in, in the Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox Church, can I be baptized by a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church while remaining in the church I'm currently in? I was only baptized in Catholicism. Yeah. Okay. We, yeah, as we said, you weren't baptized. They don't even baptize. They just pour it over your head, as you, as you say here. So you're in the Antiochian. You want to be baptized by a priest in the Russian or remaining in the church I'm currently in. I guess this is a question for the priest. It's a question for the Russian priest and then probably over to the Antiochian church. I don't know. It's up to them. I mean, you can't theoretically you can, sure. I don't know what they're gonna say, but if you're gonna be baptized, I would if I was the priest in the Antiochian parish and wanted to get baptized, and, and for whatever reason I couldn't do that, I'd say go go baptize. But I don't know what the Antiochian priest is gonna say. Can priests another question? Can priests use the argument that the Didache recommends other than immersion baptisms, like pouring when a body of water is not available for free full immersion uh well I'll, I'll, i want to ask you something today do we really have that is that really a problem is that a, is that a sincere and and practical issue today like i can't get you saw the picture right with the baptisms one of the priests there has a horse trough it's like they're plastic you can get them for like 50 bucks there's no excuse today not to baptize with full immersion zero zero excuses we're not in the first century where literally, you know, water was hard to come by in some places. And you had to walk five miles to get to a river. This is ridiculous. Get the horse trough, fill it up and baptize the people. What's wrong with us? There's no excuses. Zero. No excuses. Be orthodox. Baptize people fully. I don't know why it's such an issue. I just I don't understand. Do it. 
Another priest says canon law stated that one must be excommunicated if they miss three Sundays in a row. Therefore, canon law can be flexible since everyone would then leave the church. So canons have to be applied by real people in real time. Otherwise, they're just on paper, right? Right. And that canon needs to be applied discerningly. Yes, yes. It's not a, it's not a legal you know, like we're not policemen in the church. We're not going to hit people over the head and send them to prison. It's for their salvation. The canon is saying, look, if you don't go to church and you don't go to the Eucharist for three weeks, in those days, there's something wrong with you. And you've got to get serious about, you know, being an Orthodox Christian. Right? Is that true today? It may be. It may not be. It depends on the person, the place, the priest, and how he applies it. If, however, the priests are ignorant, indifferent, and they don't apply it because they don't care, that's a problem. If there's a priest who's very discerning and says, I'm not going to apply it for this reason, that's okay. So the question is, are we really trying to be faithful and apply the canons and apply things to it for our salvation? They're for our salvation. That's what they're there. They're for us to be saved, right? They're trying to help us. So do you want the medicine? Does he want the medicine? Does he want to be a doctor? Does he want to you know, actually apply the medicine? That's the question. I can't answer that for everybody. But that's what we need to be doing. Sean, do we recognize vowed holy orders with, with Roman Catholics? Do they have a priesthood? So let's talk about what is a valid holy order? What, what does it mean? Valid. What does it mean, valid? Priesthood serves the body. In the context of the body, in the relationship of the body, it has meaning. Outside of that, what meaning could it have? I don't take the priesthood with me and go and leave the people and serve on my own. It has no meaning. It only has meaning within the context of the body, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm the hands of Christ. I'm the mouth of Christ, the Eucharist. And Christ is the one that's offering the mysteries. So Christ, where is he? He's in the church. He is the church. It's his head and his body. So where the church is, there's the priesthood. If I go out of that church, obviously I'm not, God's not there, Christ is not there, he's not in the Bible. How does it even work? How, how can you get so legalistic to talk about priesthood apart from Christ? Because that's what they're talking about when they say you leave the church, you keep the priesthood. It becomes magical. It becomes extremely legalistic, right? So the question is, where is the church? The church is here, okay? There's, there's the priesthood. And that's, the, that's what people want to relativize today. They want so bad to relativize that and make it so it's, I can manipulate it and say, I'm in the church. It's delusional. It's the greatest heresy ever. Cumanism. It's here and not there. It's this identity and not that identity. Christ is fully God and fully man. His body is fully, fully uh, human and divine. And et cetera, et cetera. Those, I, those identity markers got to be there. It's got to be the Orthodox faith. It's got to be the Eucharist. And it's got to be continuation, et cetera. I mean, there's many things we talk about for the identity of the body. But th there's only one body. And it's the, the one that teaches orthodoxy. And that's, in, that's following the Holy Fathers. That's where the body is. So that's where the priesthood is. All right. Last question, I think, at least from... YouTube, how does one get a new godparent in that case when they apostatize? You go to your priest and you ask him, who's going to guide me? Who's going to teach me? Uh, I need somebody that, in the community who's going to help me along the way, right? And if he can't help you, go to another priest. Go until you find somebody. I, th these days are drastic. We have drastic issues in the church. I don't know who you're going to. I don't know who you're going to see. I don't know who you're going to talk to. There might be a great priest. might be a very conscientious priest. He sees the problem and he'll help you. might be another priest. God help him. And he'll be like, well, what's, he's okay. He's Eastern Catholic. That's the same thing. I don't know what he's going to tell you. But that's not the answer, right? We know that's not the answer. So um, that would be the normal course of things. You go to your priest and you say, this is what happened. He should have probably already been on this. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And can you help me? I need a guide. That basically, the Godfather is somebody who takes that responsibility to guide you, help you, pray for you, right? Give you a good example. That's what a Godfather is. All right. Um, I got a reminder here all of you who have not yet gone to the Saint 
filaret.com website, saint filaret.com website. Please visit it. Uh, we put, posted that last time. Uh, it'd be great if you uh, went there and signed the petition for the recognition of his sanctity. Uh, and But just mainly go and learn, right? Learn about him. Uh, a great confessor of our day, St. Philaret of, of New York. All right. So our question here from Austinian James Yakovos, Evlogite, I encountered a Protestant street preacher today. Are there any Orthodox saints that were street preachers? What is the Orthodox take on preaching on the street? Thank you, Father. Oh, what an interesting question. Thank you, uh, Yakovos. Um, so I don't know. No one comes to mind in that exactly, except, of course, the apostles. We have the apostles. Um, but I'm sure there are a few more. I don't know. Nothing comes to mind. Anybody else have anything comes to mind? I don't know. Nobody comes to mind that exact style, right? Which is pretty unique in our day, in this day and age, in, um, in North America. Now, if you go a little bit broader and you speak, you speak more generally, we have St. Cosmas at Delos, who went around northern Greece and, middle, and, and central Greece uh, preaching at this, uh, from village to village. So we certainly have those, those kinds. Uh, we have many of those in church history. They would go uh, from place to place and teach and preach and baptize. Um, St. Innocent Velasco did that. And that's a little different, though, but that's about as close as I can, I can get. But, yeah, that, that's possible. But is this style of street preaching, is it really under a bishop? Is it really, an, you know, to be an apostle means to be sent. That's what the word means. So we don't go and start doing things on our own without being blessed by the spiritual father and, you know, the bishop. Um, we get a blessing, we start, and we, we teach and preach uh, with a blessing. So um, at least in the beginning, you know, and we get the first, first thing. We don't want to fall into delusion by just taking it on ourselves within a context. Uh, today, with the Internet, it's very interesting and very difficult uh, because I'm not in one place, am I? I'm not in one church or one one building, and yet I'm talking to people all over the world right now, and I don't know who I'm talking to. That's unprecedented. It's a bit hard to fit into any kind of category, and it's you know it's a, kind of an economia, so to speak, for the sake of the faithful. It is what it is. But anyway, so I would say Saint Cosmas at the Los would might be one example for you, Yakovos. But uh, I don't think street preaching, you don't find that many today, no. I don't know if any Orthodox is doing street preaching. There was one guy, there was one guy in Ohio who was doing it. I remember that. Uh, I don't know what happened to him. Maybe he's still doing it. Uh, question, would not the Catholic idea of created grace completely invalidate the Eucharist? We wouldn't, we wouldn't be receiving the true body and blood of Christ, but just bread and wine. And there would be no grace from prayer from Holy Spirit, right? Not grace at all, really. So they don't have a, it's not just created grace. They talk about uncreated grace, but, and I can't, I'm not going to be able to expound the whole team. Because frankly, when I did try to find it, it was very hard to find expounded. Uh, there was one PhD thesis I found in Oxford that went into, try to go into depth. But they have a, they have both. They talk about uncreated grace and created grace and how they somehow work together and that because they're following Aristotelian categories, they have to explain it in a certain way to fit into those categories. So they end up talking about uncreated grace becoming created. And so I, I don't even know how to explain that to you. But the fact that we would even talk about it in those terms and talk about created grace, there's something wrong. We've lost touch. We can't. God's not a creation. So what is that? Like, what is it exactly that, that that's coming? Now, I'm sure there's there's going to be an attempt to try to spin it and say, well, this is what it really means. We actually don't, we don't deny uncreated grace, but it is problematic. None of the fathers ever talked about created grace. None of the, St. Gregory, nobody ever talked about created grace. The fact that they're talking about it, it means they've gone off the rails and they're trying to fit divine revelation and experience of the mystery of the, of the, the economy of salvation into philosophical categories. Uh, which is problematic. So I don't know how to answer you, how they explain that. That's a good question for the Roman Catholics. How would they explain that? I'm sure they have an answer. Despina, how is it that more Christians went with Catholics 
Uh, something orthodox. There's a typo there, Despina. Um, well, it's historical realities. We were under the Ottomans. We were under the Bolsheviks. They were free to do uh, colonialism. They basically went on the tails of the colonialists all over the world. Protestant Roman Catholics spent the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, mostly the 19th century, literally on the tails of the colonialists going all throughout the world. And as I've said in my book on missionary origins of modern ecumenism, they were instrumental in setting the stage for globalism. They brought the English language, many of them, especially the Protestants, and they brought Western culture. And basically they are the foundation upon which we have modern global society, right? So it was very much a part of, this, the, part of the times and I would be so bold to say the spirit of the age because the fruit of their work, some of it was very beneficial. I mean, for people who ended up, uh, you know, following Christ, at least they couldn't, they didn't, a lot of them didn't come put on Christ in baptism. But on the other hand, we have a very secularized world today. And a lot of those Christian attempts are not bearing fruit in any re real way, right? In terms of, theosis and illumination and purification. So the heretical, the heretical minded do not connect people to Christ in the body. That, that's not, in spite of them, people come, but not through them. So anyway, that's part of the history. If you want to read more on that, you get a little bit, I get a little bit into that into my book on uh, Missionary Origins of Modern Humanism, which you can find uh, through Orthodox, through Uncommon Mountain Press. Okay, last question, and then we're closing for the night. All right, one last question. Somebody want to try one more? Um, oh, there is one question here, I see. A parish uh, from Toby. A parish, they don't have a building, goes to a Baptist church, which has a front large enough for adults and has their adult baptismal services there. What do you think of this? Well, you know, I'm not there. I don't know the practical questions they're facing. I certainly wouldn't do that personally. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. Um, but I don't know. I don't know their situation. I don't know their the practical questions. Why do they feel they have to go there? There's no other place to do it. I would try to go somewhere else. Pers personally, I would try to go somewhere else. Now, is it a bad? Is it bad if they don't? I think I think that the canons of the church do not point us in this direction. They're pretty clear. We should avoid heterodox temples, heterodox churches, heterodox prayer with heterodox. They're pretty strict. They're pretty clear. So I would say, you know, Father, is there somewhere else we can go? If I were you, that's what I would say. Um, Theodore has a question. Father, bless. This is not a question that requires an answer, but a request. Okay. You referred to the beginning of the Bolshevik atrocities in Russia as the Russian Revolution, and in my understanding, it was more of an alien uprising and very anti-Russian. Okay, I, I accept that. Thank you. I'm just using nomenclature. Uh, nomenclature was is that right? Nomenclature. So I wanted the request that it be referred to in a way acknowledging that because I think the term Russian Revolution can cause misunderstanding. Thank you so much for your work. I have benefited greatly from it. Okay, so the Bolshevik uprising. How's that sound? The Bolshevik Revolution, we could call it, or the uh, uh, you know, Lenin came over in a, in a boxcar from the Germans, right? So um, there's a lot of destabilizing going on. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. God bless you all. Glad you were here. Hope it was beneficial. Share the, the love. If you've got people who you think might be benefited from this talk tonight, please share. Uh, if you're interested in more of this, you want to join us every Thursday night. We're doing question and answer sessions through our Patreon.com FR Peter Hears. Patreon.com FR Peter Hears. I got actually a little here. I can put the banner up and that'll help you. Um, so if you want to join us uh, this Thursday, every Thursday, we have question and answer sessions. We answer many questions, maybe 30 or 40 every time, and uh, try to help people on the way, whether they be Orthodox, inquirers, catechumens, uh, most of are in those three categories. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can get in there for $1 a month, $3 a month, whatever you want. And then you get access to all of our PDFs, all of our uploads, uh, all of our uh, question and answer sessions, of course, all of our past lectures. 
So all the lecture sessions, even those that are not available on YouTube, are available through there on the Truth of Our Faith, on Divine Liturgy, Father Seraphim Rose's survival course, my uh, my own survival course for the COVIDist insanity that was going on. So you can do that through that link there, and we hope you join us. God bless you. Be good. Be strong. Struggle. Don't get too lax during the, the, the week off here. We don't have any fasting this week. Don't get, don't get lax. Be careful. And we will see you next Tuesday for our regular installment of the Book of Revelation, uh, on the Book of Revelation, and then we're going to take a break. Then we got a break after that, and we will be off for a couple weeks. We'll let you know uh, the particulars coming up. Stay tuned. If you're not following us, on, we're on Telegram, we're on Twitter, we're on Gab, we're on Instagram, and every day we're uploading um, one-minute excerpts. Uh, excerpts from this talk will be uploaded through our YouTube channel. So you know, if, you, if you haven't, if you're on YouTube and you have not clicked the bell with the you know all the notifications, you can do that, and that would be uh, – That'd be good so you can learn about all of our future work. God bless you. God help you. And we'll see you again soon.